Welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith, along with Yvonne Osaretz. Hello. This is going to be great. I'm going to call it Matt Canol. What a story in tennis. It's not too often you get to talk to someone who's built a championship culture, among other things. And I'll call him right now because you know our podcasts are long. <laughs> Dialing once. Only twice. Hello. Hello. Matt Canole, thanks for being a guest on the Great Base Tennis Podcast. Hey, Matt. Hey, Steve. I'm so honored to be here. I have so much respect for what you've done and what you're doing. And thanks so much for, for having me on. All right, Yvonne and I look forward to asking you questions, but we have uh, questions from uh, three of your associates as well. But uh, Let me start <laughs> with this comment. Uh, Toto, this doesn't look like Kansas. When I say that, what does that make you think of? Toto, this doesn't look like Kansas. <laughs> well, it means I grew up in a small town in Kansas where, where tennis is not on the radar. Uh, so I, I don't think anybody would have predicted that I made my life in the sport, you know, when I, uh, when I you know, grew up there. Um, but, yeah, I, I was fortunate to be in a small town with a lot of family around and, you know, one of those typical American, you know, uh, environments that, you know, was, gave me a lot. I'm very grateful. What's the name of the town? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. How many people, approximately? 20,000. Uh, there's a school, a Division II school, Pittsburgh State, the Gorillas, that have a, a very nationally competitive uh, football program for their level. Um, I think 20 of my family members have probably graduated from there, including uh, one of my brothers. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a college town at a really small you know, scale, um, but everybody gets behind the Gorillas, and high school sports are a big deal, you know, like a lot of small towns, I guess. Bill in Pittsburgh plays one of their rivals, you know, these towns that are 20, 30 miles away. It's not just the high school team playing. It's the whole town plays their town. <laughs> so, you know, uh, people coming droves, you know, the buses and the cars all go over and you know, it really is uh, meaningful uh, and feels impactful to be an athlete and to be part of you know, that tradition that we have. Did you say 10,000? 20,000. 20,000. Okay. Um, yeah place called Chittenango, New York. Uh, it's a small town uh, next to a small town where I spent a chunk of my childhood. And the author of The Wizard of Oz um, is from Chittenango, New York. And they have yellow sidewalks. They have an ice cream parlor. It's called Oz Cream. And they have a museum. Um, so, I mean, obviously, as a kid, the, that show is shown over and over again. But uh, Toto, this doesn't look like Kansas. Well, I, I, I just <laughs> mentioned that, you know, so few people uh, coach a championship team as well as building championship culture. Tell us about how your family background, sports background growing up, uh, you know, took you, you know, the second segment of this, we can talk about all your accomplishments at Baylor University, but why don't you give us more feedback on uh, your passion for tennis? Yeah, and, you know, and I, such. I, I'm sitting here in my office and I'm looking at a picture of the Western Coal and Mining Company in uh, Pittsburgh and my great grandfather, Matt Canole, immigrated from Germany and he went down in the mine six days a week in the dark on his hands and knees and dug coal. Uh, it's piecework where, you know, you got paid for how much you dug. So, you know, that's, you know, our, our legacy and something that, you know, I feel really proud uh, of. Uh, you know, his son was an engineer, uh, you know, with a train, uh, not the kind that sits in an office, <laughs> uh, but the kind that you had to shovel the coal to make the train go and, uh, my dad was the first in our family to go to college. He played basketball at Pittsburgh State, that D2 school there in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, they're all, you know, athletes uh, on the weekends in their own way, but very working class family. Um, yeah, that's that's my legacy. And, and all the things I heard from my family were things about, you know, be tough, play with pain, you know, uh, you know fight for every inch. Uh, those are the kind of things that uh, I grew up with. And, and those are the kinds of things that you know I, I took to my team you know uh, be a great teammate you know always uh, feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself and whether that was their small town or for the team they played for you know that ethos was something that always meant a lot to me and and I you know I tried to you know bring that to our team and you played a uh, different sport every season played multiple sports yeah you know like like every kid I played football basketball and baseball in our town the reason I played tennis uh 
I was a baseball player in the spring, and I put my hands through a plate glass window, uh, being a knucklehead. And uh, so I really cut up my left hand badly. So I have a lot of scars on it. And I wasn't able to play baseball because of that. And I had a friend that was on the tennis team. I'd never played tennis. And remember, I'm 16. And uh, he invited me to go hit tennis balls with him. And uh, so I did. And, and I by the next spring, I had a choice to make. And I went out for tennis my junior year in high school instead of baseball. And then I had the bug, right? And then I was playing all day, every day, as much as I could. And was just uh, addicted to tennis. Uh, I learned my backhand from Tennis Magazine. They had an article comparing the Borg backhand to the Jimmy Connors backhand. And I really idolized Borg. Uh, I thought he was super cool. Nothing like me personality-wise. I'm actually a lot more like Jimmy. But uh, I went out on a backboard and tried to learn the backhand that Borg hit. Couldn't do it. <laughs> uh, it was you know, kind of risky, and I couldn't figure out how to hit it in the middle of the racket. So I started trying Jimmy's, which is, you know, flatter and cleaner and easier. And that became my best shot in tennis. And I learned it out of a magazine. Uh, so, you know, again, a very different journey uh, than most people that, that have been around the game for all their lifetime. Uh, I was a good pitcher. So I, I had a service motion, you know, so I could serve. So that was a big advantage out of the gate. And, uh, yeah, you know, that was, that was my story. You know, I, I just kind of I was self-taught. We didn't have a tennis instructor in town. I walked on at Kansas State. Uh, where they didn't have a very good team for the level. And uh, I was probably the last guy on the team. And then I got a little bit of a break. Uh, a bunch of guys got kicked off the team for whatever they were into. And all of a sudden, I found myself in the sixth spot. <laughs> so, so I played number six my freshman year at Kansas State and uh, learned a lot. You know, it took some awful beatings. Um, you know, James Wadley was the coach of Oklahoma State at the time, and they had it going. They were by far the best team in our part of the country, and uh, I lost 0-0 against Oklahoma State, and I think the guy would have beat me 0-0 100 times if we could play. Uh, but they were ranked about 10, 15 in the country. So anyway, I got a, an opportunity to be, you know, drinking from the fire hose, as they say, and that only fueled my excitement to be a player. And, you know, what I found, at least in that part of the world, was a lot of guys that were – you know, 19 were, were a little burnt out and, and had kind of lost their, their zest for, for being better. And I was at the opposite end. I was just dying to get better. Um, so I, I found a way to strategize in the summers. I went and worked at John Newcomb's tennis ranch for a while because they would let me teach in the morning and play in the afternoon. And I was around some, you know, some players that were better than me and, uh, and some other strategies like that to try to, you know, get exposed to some good tennis and just continue to be passionate about it all the way through school. Matt, what did you study at Kansas State? I was a political science major. I thought I was going to go to law school. I was admitted to some really good schools. And a guy that uh, I'll send this to, uh, Scott Pickey, uh, who I met one summer at a camp, uh, got the head job at South Alabama. And he called me and said, hey, I want you to come down and be my assistant. I said, no, I'm going to law school. And he called me a week later and said, hey, you know, there's a real glut of attorneys. I don't know if you're going to really be able to get a job, you know, and, you know, quit calling me. And he called me a week later and, and, and just kept calling me and calling me. And finally said, you know, I've got you set up where you can, you can get your master's paid for. And, you know, why don't you just defer law school for a year? I really need your help down here. I'm running the men's and women's program. I, I only have one assistant. So would you please come down and help me? And finally, basically talked me into it. Uh, so I went down to Mobile and I worked with him and, He's a super guy, uh, just a super guy, but he's a super guy. I learned a ton from him. And, uh, yeah, that was how I got into coaching, and, and I never went to law school. Uh, he, he got me uh, on a different path, uh, and I, I basically just fell in love with coaching and, and stayed on that path. So you're 22, 23, and you're a college coach. Yeah, and, and it was great. I loved the way he did it. Um, he had two teams, and he would say, okay, this week, Matt, you're the men's coach. And so I would I would coach the men. I'd do the practices and any of the matches they had, and it was all me. And then the next week, I'd be the women's coach. And I'd do all the practices and take them to the matches, and it was all me. And so I, I, I got an incredible experience, right, where I was in a leadership position, you know, under the, you know, the the mentorship of someone that knew a lot more than I did. But I was able to make decisions and run practices and coach during matches, and uh, it was incredible. It really was. And the team was good. And we had we won the Sun Belt uh, in men's and women's. So, you know, we had a very competitive, good team. Uh, we had a lot of international kids in both teams, so I got a lot of experience, uh, you know, working with kids from all over the world that were honestly 
my age in a lot of cases, right? Um, so yeah, it was it was uh, just an amazing year. Um, how long were you there, and what other steps did you take uh, with different universities before you uh, ended up at Baylor? Yeah, I, I I got in hindsight maybe a little off track, but because I I didn't have any financial support from my family because we didn't have any money, um, I got a, a very lucrative offer from a club called the Overland Park Racquet Club in, in Overland Park, Kansas. It's a big 14 court indoor facility where they host some big events, and they offered me the job to be the junior director. And at the time, it was more money than I'd ever imagined, and so I I left South Alabama to go do this club job. Um, and while I was there, I drove over to Lawrence, which is about 35 miles away, Lawrence, Kansas, where the University of Kansas is. And I got a master's degree, uh, kind of part time around my teaching schedule. Um, but, but that was ended up being really valuable to me as a college coach because I worked with, you know, I worked with five year olds. You know, I taught the TV class sometimes. You know, so I, I worked with five year olds. I worked with, uh, I had a woman, Kathy Van Eck, that came every Tuesday at two o'clock. She's 72 years old and she did that for two years, you know, and, Nothing makes you be more creative with your teaching plan than, you know, working with a 72 year old woman, you know, every week, you know, because, uh, so anyway, I, I, I had to really learn how to teach tennis, you know, to a variety of people. And I, I really feel like that was an advantage to me when I got back into college around high performance players. Uh, so anyway, I did that for three and a half years, got my master's. And then I got the job of the head coach at Northern Iowa. Uh, which is a non-scholarship uh, D1 program in Cedar Falls. Also, just a tremendous experience. The AD, a real mentor of mine, a guy named Chris Retrieve. Chris had been a wrestler at Princeton. He's been a senior associate AD at Stanford before he came to Northern Iowa. Young AD and is, you know, maybe he's 40 years old. And we became friends, and he was very kind to spend a lot of time with me talking about leadership and, and you know, uh, things I really needed to know and how to be a coach. Uh, and he taught me to love wrestling, and that's a big deal in Iowa. Uh, Dan Gable, the Iowa coach, the legendary Iowa coach, became a, uh, a hero of mine. And uh, I learned, you know, about uh, John Smith at Oklahoma State, who's also a hero of mine. And, you know, just those individual sports, there's nothing more uh, amazing than, you know, with the work that those athletes have to put in uh, physically and mentally and, and uh, the challenges that they face growing up. You know, that's what one-on-one, much like tennis, right? So I thought there were a lot of parallels uh, between you know, what they were doing and what we're doing. Then I got the assistant. I went from the head job at Northern Iowa uh, to the assistant men's job at Kansas. Uh, Kansas had been around 30 in the country the year before I came, and we were able to recruit a bunch of very, very good players, and, and we got up to 11 in the country. Uh, uh, before I left, we played Georgia in the round of 16 in Athens, you know, which was a huge moment for me as a young coach. You know, they had, you know, whatever, 6,000 people there barking at us, and they had a great team, and we won the doubles, uh, and we, you would have thought that we won the national championship. <laughs> you know, we were, we, were so, we were so jacked up, and, and that ended up being a really good lesson for me later, you know, when I was trying to, you know, coach at a high level. You know, in college, you play the doubles first, and it's only 14% of the match, right? So uh, you don't want to get – too, you know, uh, over over juice or, or down, you know, depending on how that point goes. And I think a lot of coaches, in my opinion, make the mistake of overemphasizing, you know, that one point. And we did a pretty good job later of, of being better. But on that day, we did overemphasize it. And uh, Georgia came out and whacked us in the singles. And uh, it, was a, it was a great experience. We had some great players. We had a guy named Enrique Averroa that, um, you know, won – French Open in doubles and the Orange Bowl in doubles and some other really, really good players, some All-Americans that I learned a lot from. Um, then I got the Baylor job. Uh, you know, Baylor uh, was entering the Big 12. The Big 12 was just starting. They had a new president, a new athletic director, and Baylor did a wonderful job of showing me that they had a big vision uh, for, you know, having a high-level tennis program, and and they delivered on really everything that they promised from facilities to supporting the program. Uh, and, you know, it was a little tough at the, at the beginning, to be honest. You know, we had eight courts in the field with no bathroom and no offices and no assistant coach and essentially no budget. And, you know, but we, you know, we were able to, uh, with some ingenuity and some hard work, you know, kind of figure it out. And we brought in five guys that first January and, and, uh, four of them were amazing. They were super good. Two of them were all Americans eventually. And, uh, we were able to really get it rolling. And then by our, I guess my second year we beat Texas for the first time in history, which was 
unreal. I could talk about that all day. Um, you know, the year, my first year, they beat us, you know, 7 0, we didn't win a set. And then the next year, we beat them, you know, so wow. it was pretty cool. Uh, um, I've got in my notes that was in 1997 when you started Baylor. How old were you when you started? 31. Um, and, you know, a lot of the reason I got the job is nobody wanted it. <laughs> um, Baylor had been really bad. I mean, they hadn't won a conference match, I think, in seven years. And they, uh, the year before I came, they, they didn't win a D1 match. You know, the only matches they won were against smaller schools. Ron Smar, you know, legendary coach, uh, who was at the time in Colorado, came to me and said, hey, at the NCAA, said, hey, you should look at this Baylor job. I know you want a head job. And I said, well, you know, what's the deal? And he told me all the positives. Well, why don't you take it? He said, well, they're, they're paying $30,000 a year. <laughs> I can't work for that money. Um, so, you know, the, at the time, they approached the Texas assistant and he, he decided not to apply. They approached the TCU assistant and he decided not to apply. So they, so they basically couldn't find anybody to take it. Uh, and I was, you know, just full of, full of juice and just ready for an opportunity. And, and so I took it and, uh, we raised money for our assistant coach. For example, I had a guy, a great man in, in Tyler that, uh, Bob Faulkner that gave us the money to pay our assistant and I was able to get a guy in and, you know, I can go on and on about all the things we had to do to raise money and, and, uh, stay in housing and, uh, you know, all the things that you have to do. We, one other story that the head of marketing for athletics came into our head coaches meeting and said, Hey, I have great news. Uh, Continental is one of the two airlines that flew out of Waco has given us these, these free flights. Uh, does anybody want them? Well, the thing is nobody wanted them because you couldn't control. You know, when you flew, you know, you were kind of uh, at the mercy of when flights were, you know, spaces available. So coming out of Waco, the flight, the, it was a little plane with, I don't know, 25 seats, and you'd go directly to Houston. That was the only route they had, and then you'd go from there. Well, we took every single one. I, I came in and said, I want all of them. I said, well, we can't give them all to you. we got to let other people wait. So then ended up, nobody else wanted them, and so we took them all, and we would end up having, you know, six, seven-hour layovers in Houston um, to, to make connections. Uh, but it was the only way we could have a national schedule because we just didn't have any money. Um, and I was able to get a lot of the good teams to play us with the understanding that, you know, we'll come to you. And if we beat you, then you have to come back to us. And, you know, fortunately, we were able to beat Duke and beat, you know, some other really good teams on the road. And, and that's how we built our schedule by just traveling everywhere on these free tickets. And, you know, we just kind of made it a, you know, band of brothers thing. Well, okay, pack your, pack your, you know, your books and we're going to be in the airport in Houston for, you know, five, six, seven hours uh, to play this good schedule. And the guys all, you know, bought into it and ended up being a, uh, a great group, you know, that really felt, uh, you know, they wanted to play good tennis. You know, they didn't, they didn't mind suffering a little bit to, to get a great schedule. At age 31, were you married and already, already have, ch- did you already have children? I was married. Um, my, my, my wife was one of the few people when I said, hey, I want to go to Baylor that was enthusiastic about it. She was like, oh, great. Let's do it. Um, to her credit. Does she, have, again, a ba- does have, she have a background in sports? She did. She played tennis at uh, Hamlin, a D3 school in, in uh, St. Paul. And she's you know, one of those stories. She should have played Division One, but she didn't have anybody helping her. Um, and she ended up becoming a, uh, a really good uh, nationally ranked Ironman triathlete uh, you know, later. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, very good athlete. And, and uh, yeah, it was very incredibly supportive. allowed me to work all the time. Reason, reason I asked you, $30,000, yeah. you... What did you, uh, how did you supplement your income? Did you run summer camps? We had summer camps. We had, uh, we had somebody as a roommate. We had a little tiny apartment and we moved somebody in to help us pay. Um, you know, she worked obviously. And yeah, we just, you know, we just kind of figured it out. You know, we were, uh, very committed and, and just doing everything we could to try to, you know, make that thing work. And you were there 22 years. Is that right? I was, and you know, thankfully we we started to do pretty well, and and then I got a couple job offers, and you know, unfortunately that's the way it works in coaching. If you don't have leverage with a job offer, you then so much you can get an increase in your salary. But I got some good offers, um, and and they they wanted to keep me, you know, and so they kept uh, kind of matching and increasing, and uh, you know, it ended up being just a incredible situation for our family. Here's a few things I have in my notes from my homework. Uh, Hall of Fame with Baylor University between 1998 and 2015. Your team was 105 and 13. 13 times you won the Big 12 Conference. Three times national coach. 
in the NCAA tournament, 56 and 20, top four or six times, uh, top 10, uh, 13 times. And then you were four times in the final four and it was uh, 2004 where you won it. 2005, you were in the finals, correct? That's right. Yep. So I've got some questions here from uh, one of your fans, considers himself a student of yours and a fellow, fellow coach. Uh, Joey Scrivano from Baylor. He's a women's coach. Um, let me just, can I just ask some of these questions he has? <laughs> I can't wait. All right. <laughs> Fit, uh, fitness. Uh, elaborate upon the four quarters. Well, I learned the four quarters from a, a guy uh, who's a former Romanian uh, powerlifting coach, uh, Steve Zavoric. And this is actually kind of an interesting story. So I'm teaching an Overland Park Racket Club, and the, the the guys from Johnson County Community College, which is a local you know, community college team, would come and help me with my big clinic, you know, in the in the evening, and feed balls, you know, to all these kids. And they came in and they were they all were so sore they couldn't move one day. And I said, "What's wrong with you guys?" Well, they'd been exposed. They, they they'd hired this new strength coach that had them doing this thing called four quarters. And they were telling me it was just incredible. And I'm like, "Gosh, I got so I I went and did it." You know, I said, "Can I join?" So I got a hold of the coach and I joined in and and. We're at a junior college in a hallway, uh, you know, on the linoleum tile floor or whatever with these dumbbells. And this crazy Romanian guy who's a a genius strength coach is putting us through this workout that's just unreal. I mean, so it's lightweight. You know, you're doing 15-pound dumbbells or whatever. uh, But it's repetitive and fast, explosive. And then he's got you running in the sand. And he's got you doing these plyometric things on the stairs. and, And it's unreal. Well, Steve Vork ended up being a bit of a legend in strength and conditioning in the States. You know, that was his first job when he immigrated. And all the all the top strength coaches have, have listened to him at their big convention. You know, he's a guy that everybody knows now. Um, he's become very famous with his methods. Uh, but, yeah, so we, we did the four quarters, and, and we did it. Uh, you know, it's it a little bit of, a, I don't know, a, a rite of passage and initiation, I think, when he came into our program. Uh, but it's it's very uh, anaerobic. So, you know, it, it's not uncommon for it, it, it can make you throw up if you're not in shape. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's okay sometimes when you're trying to really train at a high level. So we didn't shy away from that. Um, and the guys that we recruited knew exactly what we were doing. We lost a lot of recruits, you know, not just the four quarters, but just the way we trained. I mean, we thought that being in, uh, you know, incredible shape was a really important thing. And I felt like as a coach, it was something we could control. You know, we didn't have to, it's hard to control a lot of things, but you can control being in great shape. So it, it ended up being a, a really good thing for us in recruiting because guys that didn't want that wouldn't come, you know, and, and that was great. It was a great way to select out the guys that weren't serious about tennis. Even, you know, that was also something that was a benefit about being in Waco, you know, and Waco's not a sexy town, you know, and when guys were recruiting them said, you know, I don't want to be in, you know, in a little town like that, it was great. You know, we didn't want guys that, that wanted to care about where, where the town was because, you know, obviously when you're a college athlete, you're, you're studying and you're playing your sport and there's not a ton of time for anything else. So our, our training, not only did I think it, it, it helped us win a ton of matches, uh, I think it brought our team together and I think it uh, self-selected, uh, you know, the kind of people that we wanted to have in our program. And so it was, uh, it, it served a lot of great purposes for us. Joey, who uh, considers you to be a mentor, says he wouldn't have the job at Baylor if it wasn't you, for you. Along those same lines, uh, he's got a question in here. Uh, tell our listeners about Morning Madness. <laughs> well, again, it's, it's, it's always something, right? It's all the same stuff, right? All this, uh, the, the really hard training. You know, we, uh, we would train three times a week in the morning, at six in the morning, until we could finish the workout, right? And the workout was, you know, four quarters and some weight stuff and then some, some running that was also incredibly challenging. Um, and when we, you know, that would take between four and, I don't know, 12 weeks sometimes, you know, until the whole team got through it. And the whole team had to get through. You know, it was the only as strong as your weakest link kind of a thing. And, uh, again, they, the guys would really uh, help the, the guys that needed help. We felt like you could lead in your own way. Maybe you were great you know, in, in school, or maybe you're great in the four quarters, or maybe you're great with your forehand or whatever. And we wanted you to try to help others if, if it was an area you were strong in. And it really brought the guys together. And, 
yeah, that, that was the philosophy, and, and I think it was a, one of the reasons we had success. Uh, another question from Joey. Uh, when you started in 97, uh, what was your vision? Was your vision to build a championship culture or that Baylor would be a stepping stone? What, what were you thinking in 97? Yeah, it's a funny story, Steve. When I had my first interview with the Waco Tribune, the guy asked me a similar question. I said, what are your goals? I said, my goal is to win a national championship. And he laughed in my face. He laughed out loud. Um, and in high time, he should have. Uh, but I, look, I, I really felt at that time, I was, I was dumb enough to think that we could be as good as anybody. You know, I, I you know, I, I guess I benefit maybe not growing up in the sport. I, I didn't have any pecking order in my head that we're supposed to be worse than anybody else, or I wasn't afraid of any big brand. You know, I thought it was about people. You know, I thought if we got the right people, uh, and we train them the right way and, and we come together as a team and, and, you know, why can't, why not us? Right. And, uh, that that was our attitude, and uh, yeah, so the, I, I didn't even think about it being a stepping stone because again, at that time, I was just a kid, just so thankful to have the opportunity, you know, to be a head coach and to and to run a program and to have great leaders in the athletic department that were supportive of our vision. You know, we didn't have any resources at Baylor at the time. We, we certainly got more and more as time passed, but you know, they wanted they wanted to be good in every sport. You know, ba- Baylor felt that it was just as important to be good in tennis as football. Um, and our athletic director took a lot of pride in that director's cup, you know, the total, uh, you know, aggregate of all the different sports that you earn from, you know, winning, uh, doing well in the NCAA tournament. And that was his, that was the yard that was important to him, you know, and so he wanted everybody to do well. Um, no, this is great input. What, what about uh, from Joey, your greatest challenges starting out in Baylor? Thirty thousand dollars is one challenge, but what what were some of the other ones? Well, you know, look, we had no players. You know, to go from Kansas, where we were eleven in the country, to Baylor, where we were the worst team, you know, in, in around or three hundred or whatever, it's you know, it was a big difference. You know, the the, the level was was incredible. We had we had twenty four guys at our first meeting at Baylor, and by Thanksgiving, we had three, um, <laughs> and yeah, and it was just, you know, I came in and said, look, we're going to get up at 6 in the morning. We're going to work harder than everybody else. You know, we're going to make this a priority. And these guys were all like, you know, like they've been hit with a brick. You know, that's not how they got recruited. You know, the, the coach recruited them didn't have those philosophies. And so I, I don't begrudge them at all, right? And I helped them all transfer that they wanted to transfer and, 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 and no bad feelings. But I'll tell you, the three guys that stayed were, were, were uh, <laughs> incredibly resilient. You know, they went through a lot, you know, to, to get to that stage. And then we brought in, we brought in five guys in January. And, and as I said, four of them ended up being, you know, cornerstones of the program. One of them didn't last, uh, you know, all the way to graduation, but four of them were unreal. Um, and we were just off to the races, you know, and, and I think the thing that we did, we, we worked, you know, you hear people say, I work 80 hours a week. You know, we didn't do that every week, but we did it some weeks, you know, and, uh, that was in the days, you know, before computers, you know, and so we were calling tournament directors uh, all over the world, and I'm not exaggerating, in every time zone and saying, hey, would you fax us the draw from your tournament, you know, so that we could we could see who the players were, you know, all over the world. Um, and my assistant, Kevin Kowalik, was amazing at this stuff. He, he came into my office and he said, uh, hey, coach, where's Alex Kim going to school? I said, I have no idea. He was number one in the country at the time. He said, well, how come you haven't called him an accent? <laughs> Great question. So, so he and I divided up the top 200 boys in the country, and we called every single one of them. And the conversation went something like this. Hey, Alex, Coach Canola from Baylor. Hey, Coach. Uh, wondering if you'd be interested in coming to school here. Nah, Coach, I think I'm okay. Well, where are you going? I'm going to Stanford. Well, well how come? Well, Coach, you know, they're the number one academic school in the country. They've won the NCAA five times in a row. They're in Palo Alto, which is an incredible place to live. Coach School is a legend. And I said, wow, that's, yeah, I think you're making a great choice. Uh, but if anything changes, we'd sure love to talk to you. <laughs> so uh, we did that over and over. And, uh, you know, we didn't get any fun, but we learned a lot. You know, we learned a lot about communicating with, you know, with prospects. We learned a lot about how they view the search and what they thought was important. Um, and, and we, you know, we had, like, I don't know, two kids that let us call them back three times, but you know, those kids went to Vanderbilt and North Carolina and places like that. But we, you know, we were just trying to learn. And 
and we weren't afraid. You know, we weren't afraid to make those calls. And we weren't afraid to set the alarm for three in the morning to call New Zealand or uh, South Africa or, you know, whatever. And, and that's why, that's why we got such a great group. We, we, made, we got up in the morning, at, you know, set the alarm and made calls and, and found a way to, you know, to be interesting to people. Uh, Joey, who uh, now he's had a long run at Baylor and, you know, he's been close. He's been knocking on the door before to, uh, uh, I believe his teams have been in the semis. Um, he has down as a question, uh, what were some of the most important decisions that le- eventually led to winning the 2004 title? Hmm. Good question. I, one that stands out at the top of my head is our doubles lineup. Um, we had a very good team, but we couldn't seem to figure it out, you know, how to, how to play the doubles. And so we really struggled uh, throughout the season. And I remember this well. I, I, I'd written down as many different combinations, you know, with our whatever six or seven guys as I could think of. You know, we're going to play so and so at one and, and with so and so and so and so and two. And it's a whole formula of all these different combinations. And I had them written down in a notebook. And I really couldn't figure out what to do. And so we're getting ready to play Pepperdine. I'm sitting in Malibu in the bleachers. And the time is coming where, you know, it's whatever a half hour, an hour before the match. And I've got to turn the lineup in. And I don't know how to turn in the doubles. So I just kind of guessed, right? And, you know, and, and I turned in this doubles lineup and, and it ended up being exactly the right lineup. It, it worked. We won that day and, and that's the way we played it the whole year. And we ended up being, I mean, so dominant in doubles, uh, over the course of the year. Uh, so I think that, that decision was a really big decision, uh, for us that, that made a, a really big impact. Um, Gosh, aside from that, I think I learned a lot in my in, in 2000. We, in 99, we beat Stanford, who was the three-time defending champion in the round of 16, which was a you know massive for us. And then we played Georgia in the quarters, and we lost 4-3, and we had a match-match point. Um, and so, and then Georgia ended up winning, right? So, you know, we were you know we based on the evidence, we felt like we were good enough to win, right? We were right there, um, and we had almost the whole same team coming back the next year. And I absolutely botched that season. I was, I was terrible that year. I, there were four seniors that had all been the, that four guys I told you came in that first January and they were seasoned and great guys and amazing. And I just beat on their heads and made them hate me and made them hate tennis. And it was just an awful year uh, because I just pushed too hard. I didn't, I didn't trust them. You know, I needed to trust them. I needed to trust that they knew, you know, they, they, they'd been through it. You know, they'd proven themselves. I, I needed to back off a little bit and, 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 you know, let them lead more. And I didn't. And we ended up not having, a, we won the Big 12, but we didn't achieve at the end that we anything that we wanted to. And so it was very disappointing. And I, I think when we got the, the next generations of good players, I was, I, I treated them differently. I was much better at, at getting out of the way and allowing them to have more space. And I think, you know, one of the things I guess I feel most proud of about my time at Baylor is we were very good with multiple generations. You know, we, we'd lose all the guys and still be good again and lose all the guys and be good again. And and when the guys showed, you know, that they warranted, uh, you know, some, some space and, and an opportunity to lead in their own way, I, I got out of the way, you know, and, and learned, Watching others, frankly, uh, that was the way to go. And, and I, I watched you know, Dick Gould. Um, Dick, you know, won 17 national titles. And when I watched Dick coach big matches, he was incredibly calm. I never saw him raise his voice. I always never saw him run from court to court. I never saw him jump up and down. You could see that, you know, that he'd empowered the players, you know, and he was there to support them. And Manny Diaz was another guy that I had a lot of respect for. Uh, that was older than me that same, you know, very confident, but, uh, but not, not manic, you know, not erratic because I, I feel like I watch coaches today and, you know, they're going out to the baseline between every point and they're running all over the place and screaming. And, and I think that I, I feel like it shakes the players up. You know, I, I know for myself as a player and, and I'm sure you're the same, Steve, you don't really want a coach coming and talking to you between every point and yelling at you and, you know, and all that. I mean, that's just, let, let me play tennis. Right. And, uh, but I think watching them and learning from my own experience, I got more and more uh, balanced and, and, you know, preparing hard, but then on match day, you know, giving the guys a little more space to just go out and play. 
No, oh, it's great to hear. I coach, uh, as you know, a lot of college players, and my students have coached a lot of college players. I'd say that's a, one of the biggest complaints is that they want to be left alone during the matches. They don't want someone talking to them every minute. Although there are the the exceptions to the rule. I think I remember of a player, Amir Delic, with you know, Craig Tyler, saying that you did so much better when someone was talking to him. Uh, with another question that jumps out with basics, shot tolerance, and competitive spirit, but uh, all three, but. Uh, Joey wants to know how what what did you do on court to have your players just be so tough with shot tolerance, keeping keeping the ball in play? Well, you know, we call it point building, right? When you're back behind the baseline in a neutral position, and, and the you know the mantra was never miss wide, never miss in the net, right? You're trying to play deep, you know, so you don't gain anything by hitting it close to the sideline when you're so far behind the baseline, and you don't certainly gain anything by playing short. So, you know, we worked a lot on, on hitting the heavy ball and, and backing guys up, you know. So that was, you know, that was one of the real mantras of how we did things. And, and you know, if you ask any of the guys that played for me, you know, when do we miss wide or when do we miss in the net? <laughs> they never. That would be their response. Um, That's great. So we really, we really held them to that, you know. And if they miss wide, you know, and they, they would, and then their self talk, right, would be don't miss wide, you know. And, and so that was great. And, and then, you know, when you can, when you create a little bit of an opportunity that you can step up towards the baseline and capitalize, uh, and, and now we're looking to change direction and flatten the ball out a little bit more and play more offense. Uh, and then, you know, when you're in the middle of the court, you're attacking and finishing. Those, those, this is our vocabulary we use. And when you're attacking and finishing, look, I didn't, I really didn't mind if you missed wide some. You know, I want you to, if you're trying to finish, you know, you gotta, you gotta go for it. You know, so go for it. You know, and if you miss wide once in a while, we'll practice more. But that's a, you know, that's a smart shot. Um, you know, we talked a lot. You know, one of the things my sayings was, it's okay to be bad, but don't be stupid. You know, so, uh, you know, missing wide, you know, from, you know, five feet behind the baseline is stupid. You know, that's not bad. That's just, that's just stupid. Um, you know, getting a ball in the middle of the court and shoving it, you know, into the guy's forehand so he can pass you, that's not being bad. That's being stupid, right? So it's okay to be bad. We'll practice and we'll get better, right? So we have no, no issue with you being improvement. But we do have an issue with you making, you know, poor tactical choices. Um, I also was a huge believer, and still am, of making every second serve return. You know, I, I just think that there's, in my view, there's no value in slapping a few, you know, flashy returns off second serves and then missing five in a row. You know, I don't think that puts any pressure on anybody. I, I think rather make every one. And again, you have to couch this, you know, and I'll say this. I, I would talk to my guys all the time. Don't watch Carlos Alcaraz on TV. That's not the same sport that we're playing. Don't watch Federer. Don't watch Nadal. Don't watch Djokovic. We're not playing that sport. Right? That's, that's a different sport. Right? And it, it, you know, it's just like you know, Steph Curry comes down in the NBA and he jumps up from you know eight feet behind the three point line with a six eight guy guarding him and 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 that goes in. Right? Well, I can't do that. <laughs> Nobody else can do that. Right? That's why that's why he's Steph Curry. Right? Because it's unbelievable what he's doing. And it's the same thing with these guys in tennis, right? We, when you're, uh, you know, when you've got 10 ATP points, like, you know, the kind of guys we had at Baylor, you don't have to play the level that's going to beat Roger Federer. You know, you don't, you don't have to play at the level that's beating guys that are playing challengers. You know, your goal is to become a guy that can win futures, win, you know, and then get to the challenger level and, and start to win at the challenger level. And you don't have to beat Roger Federer to do that. And so we, we, we made sure that we understood where we were and, and tried to build on, on that, you know, and I would say when you get to be, you know, 75 in the world, you know, then you're going to have to do some things a little bit differently, you know, to beat the guys ahead of you, but you're going to get to, you can get to the main draw of the grand slam, just being a really solid, good tennis player, being in great shape, uh, you know, being aggressive on your first serve, making every second serve return and being tactically solid. You can make the, you, you can make grand slams like that, right? Now, again, if you're going to win them, it's, it's a different thing. And, but, or to make it to the second week, et cetera. But, uh, we, those are things we really believed in and talked about a lot. And I think that's really hard, Steve, for guys that are, you know, number one in their country in the 18s or, you know, played the junior grand slams or, you know, uh, won a future or have a few ATZ points. You know, it's easy to get, you know, out over your skis, you know, and, and think that now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Roger Federer. It's a developmental process. Right. And you have to add pieces, uh, you know, uh, along the way and not rush to the to a, a finish line that, you know, may or may not even exist. Right. I mean, let's 
let's try to continue to improve and not try to be somebody that we're not. I'm loving this. I can tell by a smile on Yvonne's face. He's loving it. So it's great to talk to and our <laughs> listeners too. It's great to talk to a tennis mind with um, potential recruit, uh, Joey, again, uh, how do you determine the value? How did you know that this is the guy I want to select to be with us for four or five years? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's, I'll call it the money ball uh, thing, right? I, I don't really, if you're able to be effective, then we can work with, with the way that you're being effective, right? If, if you're, if you're winning a lot of tennis matches with a jacked up forehand, then we'll, you know, we, we can try to help you with your forehand, but there's something to being a winner uh, that I think is really difficult to teach when you're 19 years old, right? And so we loved it if we could find guys that were, you know, highly ranked in their country. You know, if you won the junior nationals or, or, or whatever, you know, at the highest possible level. And we had a guy, Julian Lentz, for example, you know, he showed up, he won the junior U.S. Open doubles, right? And so he played those kind of tournaments and all that. But then after he'd done that and he signed with us, he showed up at the German uh, indoor nationals as the number one seed in singles and doubles. And, and I'm not sure everybody can appreciate how much pressure you're under when you walk into the building, you know, as a 17 year old kid in that situation, you know, everyone's pointing at you. There's the guy that won the junior U S open doubles and he's the one seed. And I had so much respect for the fact that he won the tournament in singles and doubles in, in a way with nothing to gain, right? There's nothing for him to gain in terms of ranking or, or respect. He went there because he wanted to try to get better and he wanted to put himself in a challenging situation and, and he came through. And I, I'll tell you, I have so much respect for that. Um, the other thing I have a ton of respect for, and I'll, I'll point out a guy named Will Little from Joplin, Missouri. You know, Will, uh, you know, Missouri Valley is not a very strong section. And Will was a, you know, a top 10 in the country type junior. And he went out and played guys that were, you know, a standard deviation worse than him regularly in the sectional tournament. And he just beat him into the ground. I mean, he, it was 6 1, 6 1, 6 2, 6 0, you know, 6 2, 6 2. You didn't see him take those matches and, and just throw away a set or, or win five and six or, you know, not bring it all the time, you know. And I, I just had so much respect for that with Will that he was able to come out and focus and play at his best possible level, regardless of the competition, you know. Um, and then, of course, he, you know, he played great against the guys that were his level. But he, uh, those are the kind of things that when I look at results or look at I'm evaluating a player, uh, really jump out to me. And, and then you know, the other thing was we were very you know, uh, overt about, look, this is a, this is a tennis opportunity, right? We're, you're coming here to play tennis. Baylor's a good school. You're going to get a good degree. But, you know, we, we're looking for guys that want to play, that want to you know, train a lot, that want to push themselves physically, that want to you know, have really high goals. And, and that's who we recruited, you know. And, um, again, it's, it, what a difference when you come to practice with guys that, you know, are all on the same page uh, versus just kind of, you know, getting lucky. And I promise the guys when I recruit them, I'm not going to put other guys in the locker room that aren't like you. You know, that's my job. You know, I'm going to surround you with like-minded people, you know, that, that are here for the same reasons you are, that have similar goals to your goals. And I felt like if I did that as a head coach, you know, that was uh, a big part of my responsibility. Uh, here's a question, and I had heard this story. This is great to hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, memorable stories, uh, one being uh, the growth and development of uh, Benjamin Becker. Tell us about Benny Becker's story at Baylor. Yeah, you know, Benny, small town in Germany, um, uh, <laughs> just didn't like Santa. I mean, <laughs> put, it, put it simply. I mean, there you go. There's the opposite story of what I just told. I, obviously, Benny uh, was, a, was a super talent. Right. And he didn't know it. Uh, he was, you know, he'd had some stuff in his family. Uh, he was a little off track, um, no fault of his own and just was really struggling, you know, and, and, and I liked his, I liked his coach. I know his coach. He's a great guy. Dirk Deer, who was a good player. And I went over to watch Benny play and, and he looked great in practice. He looked terrible in the matches I watched him play. Um, but I spent a lot of time with him. You know, he and I walked around a lot in his little small town by the Star River there in Zarland. And, and I, I just really felt like he was a quality person and just needed help. You know, just needed somebody to believe in him. Um, and he came over and he, he just he didn't want to practice. 
And so, really, I spent the whole first year he was with us just screaming at him all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's incredible to think about now. Uh, I would only let him practice with our number seven and eight guy because he was so bad in practice that he would mess up the practice of the guys that were in the lineup. Um, and, you know, I, would, I remember well, we played a fall tournament and we lost to somebody that uh, you wouldn't think it was possible for him to lose to. We were in the locker room, and I was screaming as loud as I, I mean, it's a little embarrassing almost now. And, and I told him he was stealing a scholarship from the program with his effort. Um, and the thing about him, when the season started, he cared so deeply about his teammates that he was a different guy. You know, when it was the team, he found his, he found his footing in the team matches. He really did care, and now he's a different person, right? And, and so that's, we just needed to get through that first ball until we got to the team and then he he became you know he got on the path to become who he's become um that said you know at the end of his career after he'd won the ncas and, and done all those amazing things he didn't want to play uh and I, and I he had an offer from an agent that was going to support him and you know pay some money to help him go out and play and give him some coaching and and he didn't want to go you know and, and at that time he had no ACP points the german federation had no intention of supporting him uh, the USDA had just recently quit giving the wild card, you know, to the, to the NCAA champion. So he had zero points and, and limited desire. And I just, we, I sat down in my office and said, look, go and, and try at least, you know, please for me, go out and at least try. And he went out to California with no points, playing quality. And he qualified and won the tournament, qualified and won the tournament, qualified won the tournament. <laughs> you know, and he, and it was just basically off the races, you know, and just, uh, had a great coach. Um, Tariq Benabilis, you know, who coached Roddick, um, was leading the coaching group. A guy named John McFontenot was traveling with him and they did a great job with Benny. And, uh, you know, the guy was in, he was ACP newcomer of the year before he knew it. You know, he's playing, you know, Roddick in the, you know, what it'd be in Agassi at the U.S. Open, uh, you know, not long after that, you know, just took yeah, off like a rocket. He was 35 in the world. Yeah. Yeah. He got up, he got up quick. You know, he, uh, and, and, you know, I remember when Benny, he beat Andre, I guess he, I was in the, the press conference after and, and people were asking him, well, where have you been? You know, <laughs> and, you know, and he's like, well, I've been playing, you know, you guys just haven't noticed me. I've been in Waco, Texas, you know, fighting my tail off every day, getting better. Uh, but, you know, the ATP folks and the Federation folks, you know, didn't pay attention to the college guys back then, particularly. And, um, they asked him. Funny question to ask him, was that the toughest environment you've ever been to? And I don't know if anybody of your listeners were at that match, but, uh, you know, the Arthur Ashe was full and Benny had three people on his side, me and two other people in his box, his teammates, and everybody else was booing him when he hit a good shot. And it was really tough, right? Because everybody was, of course, you know, coach, you know, cheering for Andre, he was an icon. And they said, was that the toughest situation you've ever been in? He said, no. He said, actually, you know, I had a tougher situation when we played Texas Tech in Lubbock. Because the the crowd was all stinking drunk and they were cussing at me uh, over the fence, <laughs> so uh, I, I thought that just emphasized how college tennis, you know, in tough environments, you know, can really help a player develop and learn to focus uh, even more maybe than you know than the pro environment. I was at that match. I wasn't going to go, but I was, you know, back in those days, the the national teachers conference was a, just a great event held in uh, Manhattan at the old Roosevelt. And I was with the late Tom Fye and we just said, Hey, let's go. And we didn't have any tickets, but with Fye's uh, magnetic personality through the USTA, we found some tickets, but yeah, we were there for uh, Agassiz's last match. Uh, you've already really commented on this, a byproduct of all the hard work and the winning as well. But it's really interesting when you hear people that have been part of a, a winning culture, they don't talk so much about winning. They talk about what they did to win. Um, but Joey's got down, uh, if you'd comment on the Baylor brotherhood, he thinks it's, uh, exceptionally strong. In other words, yeah, you're, you're coaching, you're, you're former players. Yeah. Look, I'm not really a tennis coach. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher that just happens to have found tennis as a way to teach. Um, you know, just by luck, you know, I, I could be doing it someplace else, but it, I, I believe deeply in, in the people that I was around. It was way more important to me to have 
that brotherhood that Joey's talking about, right? And and I I I made it a point to invest everything I could in every guy, you know. And um, you know, they came over to my house. I I took them to lunch. I you know we did individuals with I did individuals with every guy, you know, every week, and some guys multiple times a week. And I'll tell you, Steve, those yeah, you, know, you run out run out of team practice is great, right? And but when you do an individual, you know, sometimes we we worked on their their stuff. We had a developmental plan for everybody, of course. But sometimes we just talk. You know, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, well, you know, I'm having this. My, my dad's going through this. You know, or my I'm having this personal situation, and we just didn't talk. You know, and and I think that mentorship, uh, you know, helped the guys trust that I cared about them as people, which allowed them to trust. Uh, in everything that we were doing, you know, and all the things we did with, you know, we did a ton of community service, for example. And, you know, the guys rolled their eyes the first time you do it, right? And I, I continued to turn the knob to try to figure out what's the right thing to hit the right button. You know, we did Habitat for Humanity to build a house, and that was the wrong button. You know, we did clinics for people. That was not the right button. Finally, the button we found is we did tutoring in an underprivileged middle school. Um, and these kids in Texas have to take this star test where it's a really big deal, right? And there's all this pressure on these kids to take this, this test every year. And, you know, I, I said, I, I got in touch with the principal at the middle school and I said, well, would you mind if we came over and tutored? And he said, yeah, we need math tutors so bad. You can't believe it. So we started going over and tutoring these kids in math. And that was the, that was the nod to turn because not only were, making a difference with kids but but they build a personal relationship with these young people right these 12 or 13 year old kids and so you know they'd come back next week and the kids would be excited and and the kids would come and watch us play and so we had we built some really cool momentum uh that way uh and, and that's just an example we, we did a lot of things like that you know that were outside of center you know we when we did our running on saturdays we ran in the in the woods in cameron park you know and 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 I had this thing. We we did this run called Can't Beat Coach. So it was to try to train their their uh, anaerobic system. You know, because if you run too fast, then you're you're not training anaerobically anymore. And so uh, that was a tradition where I they couldn't pass me. <laughs> so uh, I would control the pace, and and then they'd come up and I'd ask them questions. I'd say, Hey, I'd yell, whoever, Steve, come up here. And I'd say, Steve, okay, hey, who was the first Baylor All American? And if they didn't know the answer, I'd say, Hurry, everybody, see that. That's a stop sign over there. Go run and touch that stop sign. So they'd have to go run and touch the stop sign and then catch up with me. And I'd like run through the buildings on Baylor's campus. I'd run into like the business building and run up and down the stairs and run through the library or whatever. And they'd have to chase me. And it became a thing. They'd see the tennis team, you know, running through the buildings on campus. Um, uh, it was things like that. They just made it fun. You know, just more than hitting your forehand and your backhand. They're just uh, common experiences, right? That brought the guys together. Uh, that, again, made it. You know, more than just, you felt like you are more than, uh, you are so, part of something bigger than yourself, right? And uh, those things, I think, brought guys together. And uh, that's, I think, why, you know, those guys are so close today and, and why it's bigger than, you know, winning a ring or winning a trophy. Uh, with Joey, who obviously was a bystander, you know, running the women's team. So you say, again, he learned so much from me, but why did you not overpraise your players and tell them the truth? <laughs> Why do I, I overpraise my players and tell them the truth? That's what he's got um, down. Yeah, you know, I think it's that thing we've all heard, right? Um, you know, bad players want to be left alone. Good players want to be coached, and great players want to be told the truth. And 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 I just, I that was again part of recruiting. You know, I I I told them the truth. You know, I watched them play, and I say, look, this is this is what I see, and and. For the people that that hurt their feelings and that wasn't a good fit for them, then then thankfully they wouldn't come. You know, the kind of guys that we recruited wanted to be told the truth, um, and and so we did. And and sometimes that's tough. Uh, the thing about telling people the truth and holding them super accountable is that you've got to do it yourself, right? Like, you know, just a silly example: if if we're gonna start practice at two o'clock and I'm sitting out there on the court, you know, at one forty-five, you know, with my shoes laced up. Uh, my racket script, my practice plan sitting there. And so when the guys walk up, you know, I'm ready to go. You know, I, I, ne I was never late, never once. I mean, never one time. Um, I was never not prepared, never once, not one time. You know, I never, uh, I never, 
uh, guessed at what we were going to do that day. I always had a plan. I always was ready. And, and again, so if I'm not doing it, then of course I can't expect them to. But that was the standard, right? I mean, and then everybody met the standard. And then you get an incredible work done. That's just one example. Time's a simple one, right? But uh, just in terms of the focus and the discipline and the commitment, it has to start with the leader, I think. And then you can hold everybody else to that standard. I know eventually you're going to tell us about what you're currently doing, which is you're so you're still connected with uh, college athletics, but uh, Joey's got down. Um, how has it changed? How, how has college athletics changed uh, during your journey, your, your time on the road, down the road, up the road? Woo, oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think I'll just speak to tennis. Uh, you know, obviously we talk about all the money and all the stuff that's going with NIL, which is all massive changes. But I think just with tennis, uh, I think tennis, uh, in the last several years has become uh, de-emphasized uh, on college campuses. And I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed to see that. Uh, I don't see, even in the Power Four conferences, I don't see a lot of schools that really are committed to, to being the best that they can be, you know. Um, and so I, I wish that was the case. I, I, I see there are some coaches and some programs that are doing an amazing job, but there's some others that are, or happy to be second or fifth or 15th, right? And, and I think that uh, I call it, uh, I write it on my board here, you know, uh, submitting to the brand. You know, it's like, you know, we're at, uh, we're at a school that's, you know, perceived to be the less, you know, the, the least uh, dynamic brand in our conference. So we're not supposed to be Michigan or Ohio State. You know, Michigan and Ohio State is better than us. You know, they have more to do. Texas, we can't, how are we supposed to beat Texas? You know, Texas has everything. Why would we beat Texas? You know, we're, we're so and so, you know, or, and I, I don't, I don't think teams do that in, in football and basketball, but I think they seem to be doing it more in Olympic sports where it's, it's just okay to, to not strive for excellence. And, and that's disappointing to me. You know, I can tell you that, you know, when I came to Baylor, our athletic director played basketball and baseball at Baylor and nothing made him happier than being Texas at anything. I mean, that, you, know, you, you want to beat them in golf, tiddly wink, you know, ping pong. And, and tennis and so we did you know and that's why we had a winning record against them because we didn't come in and say well we've never beat you before so we're going to be happy to lose to you all the time um so I, you know, that's that's a, that's a very biased uh, opinion coming from a guy that sees it from a certain angle but uh but yeah I, I wish that everyone in our sport would strive to greatness uh, across the board more than i think they are now no Touche. Uh, advice for future college coaches. What comes to your mind? Yeah, I think it's a tougher business than it's ever been, right? Um, it's really fascinating. The, 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 the assistant coach job in Power Four has become a, a really pretty good job all of a sudden. You know, these that group of people are, are making a, a, a suitable living uh, in the Power Four conferences, most of them. Um, but what that's done is, unfortunately, the, the mid-major jobs, are not very good jobs anymore. The, the salaries, you know, I just talked to, you know, one of the things I do, Steve, is help athletic directors hire coaches. I just talked to a mid-major athletic director today, and they're paying their head coach $40,000 a year. Well, you know, that's for a head coach in Division One. I. I mean, that's that's tough, right? I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, for people in the game of tennis, you obviously can do way, way better, you know, teaching at virtually any club in America. So the pool of people that are willing to come in in 2024 and make that money you, know, you, have to have, you have to have a college degree you know you have to have some level of experience um so i i fear for where the, that profession is going with the limited opportunities uh, across the board you know for, for people that you know need to support their families but still are super passionate about you know teaching kids and and, and being around the game um knowing what you know now what would you do differently with a reflective thought? What would you do differently going back if you could, which we can't do, but um, if you turn the clock back, would anything come to your mind that you do differently? Well, look, to be totally honest, um, I would have, I would have left Baylor. Um, you know, I, I think the, the thing that I would observe uh, basketball coaches move a lot. You know? and, and the thing about, the thing about staying at one place is that uh, the thing about moving is it's fresh. You know, you're the new guy, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, everything's uh, fresh and new and, 
and exciting. And, and I think that I was, I was put to sleep a little bit because I had a great athletic director that hired me, a guy named Tom Stanton. Um, I had a great athletic director that came after him, a guy named Ian McCaw. And then I got something different after that. And uh, I think at that stage, it, 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 it would have been, it made it, it felt to me like I, sh- I should have got a fresh start. Um, and so I would say that to coaches, and I talk to a lot of coaches every day. It's easy to get stagnant, you know, and, and a lot of coaches feel like they're getting, they're taken for granted. And again, I think if you're the new guy, you're fresh and new, and, and uh, maybe that's energizing in some way. Last one from Joey. Uh, I think these are great that he sent me these questions. Um, actually, we're scheduled to go to Baylor to do a workshop. Uh, you know, his players will attend his teaching in college coach, college players, uh, the, the power of peer teaching. And then we'll stay for a few days afterwards and work with some juniors. Um, but would you ever consider returning to college tennis? You know, Steve, the, that job is the best job in the world, in my opinion. Uh, I, the, the, the positives there were, are, are over the top good. I mean, so amazing. Um, I've actually looked at two jobs in the last six years um, where I thought, you know, I could maybe go back and, and teach and, and work with young people and, and build a, a, a culture that was special. Um but, but so far, I haven't found anything that was the right fit for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not something I think about every day by any means, but it's something I, I remember incredibly fondly. And I think if uh, if a great AD that, you know, wanted to do something special uh, reached out to me, I mean, for sure, I take the call. You know, um, uh, I'm very fortunate now. You know, my wife and I were empty nesters. You know, all my kids are all, you know, the last part of their college. Um, you know, we can you know, we're very flexible and we're always up for the next adventure. Uh, before we go on to the questions from the next coach, tell us something, tell us a few things about your kids. Yeah. So Megan is uh, at Emory uh, in graduate school. She's doing neuroscience. Uh, she's awesome. Um, Karch plays tennis at Grinnell. He's going to be a senior next year. He's trying to decide if he wants to coach or go to law school. So we have a lot of those talks now. Hannah's a twin uh, with Karch. She's a senior at Davidson. She's uh, chemistry. She's planning to get a PhD in chemistry. Um, and then uh, Kate is at Arkansas, and her plan is to be a speech and language pathologist. All great kids, all nerds, all were <laughs> you know incredibly strong students. Uh, nothing like like me, <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, I was just going to school to play sports. Uh, they were all great students, um, and all have you know uh, our joy, and you know we're very blessed and. Uh, can't wait to see, you know, what comes next for them. Well, you and your wife sounds like you've done a fantastic job. Um, how much do you uh, attribute that to being around parents and learning what to do and what not to do? Hmm. You know, I, I think that the, the, I would go back to just having a plan and having a system and then sticking to the system. You know, uh, I think if you, I was surprised, you know, any parents will appreciate this maybe, great people that we were, you know, we started kindergarten with and I love them and they're awesome friends. You know, their, their kids are my kids' friends. And then I watched the way they parented and they just let them get away with murder. <laughs> you know, the, the kid would do whatever you know, and they just, you know, they just let it happen, you know, and then when you let it happen once, then it happens twice. And, and then you wonder why when they're teenagers, you've got a, you've got a tough situation on your hands. Right. right. Um, you know, I was just talking to Karch. Karch is working the NC State camp down there right now, and they've put him in a leadership position, which has been great for him. And I asked him today, uh, how did it go? And he said, well, I, I think I made a mistake. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I feel great working with the 14, 15-year-old, but I struggle sometimes with you like a 10, 11. Uh, and I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, they, they start messing around and throwing balls around, and, and I kind of let them go for a while. And then I finally it gets too much, and I tell them to stop. And they're mad because now I'm being unfair because I've let them do it for the last half an hour. And I said, well, yeah, what a great leadership lesson, right? right. You got to stop it at the beginning, you know, because if you let it go, it just you know, it keeps growing. And then other kids jump on board and now you got a, you got a mess on your hands. So I, I think as a parent, that's how we did it. You know, we, we didn't let it go at the beginning, you know, and then when they got to be teenagers, we didn't have to say it twice. You know, we, we didn't have to say, 
you know, uh, take the garbage out two times. You know, once was all it took. You know, we didn't have to say study two times. We didn't have to say be home at a certain time. Right? All that stuff was already in there because we did the hard work when they were, you know, much, much younger. And I, I think it's, right, it's just leadership. It's the same as coaching a team. You know, when they come in as freshmen and they try to do certain things and you make sure they understand that that's not okay, and then by the time they're sophomores, you don't even have to talk about it anymore. You know, it's just part of the routine. It's the system. Um no, that's I, what we did as parents. No, it's great. I like the formula: respect first and love, love second. With uh, yeah, the the late Bobby Knight, uh, the basketball legend. He uh, he certainly said that that parenting was better in, in generations gone by because it was just that it was uh, soft love, tough love, and and cr- crazy love. I mean, you just can't have soft love. I mean, just. Uh, how's Jim Lair say it? You can't have uh, the pillows have to be softer and the marshmallows have to be sweeter. Um, <laughs> uh, Dave Anderson, I know you know Dave a long time. I've known Dave forever. Um, he was with me for eight years. Um, he's asked about your coaching tree. Tell us a little bit about your coaching tree. You must have pride in uh, what some of your former students are doing, former players. Well, it means a ton to me, to be honest, Steve. It's one of the things that I, I really, you know, it brings me a lot of joy. Um, you know, I've had assistants go on to be the head coaches of, I'll miss some, just talking now, but you know, Notre Dame, Tennessee, Colorado, Oregon, Wichita State, LSU, Pacific, Old Dominion, uh, Purdue, if I didn't say that one, um, and several others. You know, again, I can't even think of them all, but a, a lot of guys going on to stay in the profession um, and, and coach at a high level. And I, get, I, I have a lot of pride from that. I think that's, uh, that's really cool that they, you know, again, these are all outstanding people that could do anything. You know, these guys could succeed in any field and that they've decided to, you know, put their incredible talents into, into young people and, and the college coaching system and really a gift to everybody that they touch, uh, they touch. And I'm just so glad that I could be a small part of it. Wow. That's, that's a lot of top schools. Um, Here's one, uh, Dave Anderson, if I have the name right, Brandon Birmingham, elaborate upon his story and his value to your teams. Yeah, you know, Brandon came along at that time when my first year, right, when we were uh, really transitioning. And Brandon reached out to me from Dallas and said, I want to be on the team. And I said, well, Brandon, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just don't think you're good enough. He was at a Division II school in Texas. And he said, oh, yeah, I've seen the Baylor teams. Yeah, I'm, I'm for sure good enough. I said, well, yeah, but Baylor's next year is not going to be the better that you see in the past, right? So I, I just, you know, thanks so much, but, you know, no thanks. And he, and he came down, the way someone said, just give me a chance. He said, I'll, and, and I'm not exaggerating, I'll carry the towel, I'll, I'll, I'll get the water, I'll, I'll do anything. Just give me a chance. I don't need a scholarship. I, I just want to be on the team. You know, I mean, how do you turn that down, right? And, and such a good guy. And I talked to Dave Anderson, who was his coach. And, you know, he's the hardest working kid in every clinic. He's, he's, you know, he's the first to come, last to leave. He's outworking everybody. Well, you know, I, I got space for that, you know, so he came and he, he wasn't good enough to play for us. Uh, but he became a leader. And, and I think that's part of what, you know, you've been talking about so gratifying about our program. He didn't have to be a guy in the lineup to have a voice, you know, because uh, he was doing the work. You know, he was working just as hard as everybody else. And the physical work was, you know, uh, immense. Um, and so he was doing the same work and he had the same respect as everybody else. And he had a very, uh, emotionally intelligent person, Brandon, and he became an incredible leader for us. And I'll give you a quick story. We, you know, we lost that quarterfinal, uh, in the NCAs, uh, in what was his junior year. And, you know, then George went on to win and, and he went down to the bookstore and got a, uh, you know, a little uh, postcard. For every guy, it was at the University of Georgia. And at that time, the, you know, the final sign was always in Athens. And he, he wrote on the back of every postcard for every guy. Um, see you back here. That was whatever, 1999. See you back here on this date in 2000. And we're going to, you know, we're going to win the national championship last, next year. And he handed that, he went to every guy individually and handed them that postcard from the University of Georgia with his handwritten note about how we were going to be back next year and, and achieve our goal. Uh, I mean, who does that? <laughs> I mean, that, uh, that had nothing to do with me. You know, that was completely him. You know, and, and then he wanted to go to law school, but he he wasn't a very focused student. So his grades weren't great. 
so he didn't get into any of the fancy law schools in, in Texas. So he went to the South Texas School of Law, which is not a fancy law school in Houston, and worked his tail off. And then he wanted to be a prosecutor and do public service with the DA's office. So he went in for his interview, and he tells his story better than I do. But he's sitting in the waiting room, and there's, I don't know, six other candidates there and with their resumes and their nice suits. And Brandon's the kind of guy that said, hey, you know, where'd you go to law school? I went to SMU. Where'd you go to Texas? Where'd you go? And they all had you know, fancy law degrees from these good schools. And he's thinking to himself, well, gosh, I have no chance. You know, there's no way I'm going to get this job. So he went in with the DA, and it turns out the DA had run track at SMU. And Brandon had his Big 12 championship ring on that we'd won that year. And in that interview, they didn't say one thing about his grades, didn't say one thing about his philosophies with law. All they talked about was his experience winning the Big 12 championship on the Baylor tennis team. And sure enough, he got the job and got in the DA's office. And then he did amazing. And then he now he's a judge in Dallas County. He's, he spent his career on the bench. And he's doing some really fabulous things. Uh, they're on the bench, you know, uh, made his career. So that's Brandon Birmingham, just the hardest working, best guy you could ever imagine. That's a great story. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Anderson, again, Navy SEALs, uh, this is a compliment. Uh, what was the catalyst? I think you've already touched upon this, but uh, he said the Baylor players, and he actually, I have down uh, the next question uh, from him, um, a point, but because I ended up having, uh, you tell me the last names from Hung the Hungarian Zoltan. Zoltan Pop, yeah. And then Barry from Scotland. Yeah, Barry McLaren. And then Matias from Argentina. Yeah, Matias Moran. I know that uh, at one time, um, the Brookhaven facility in Dallas, they hired coaches from your program, and they they did they took the steps to help them with work permits. Um. But I know in talking to those players, I had heard so much about the Baylor program, but to actually then have these three young people, they were all at different times. And they were short visits too, I would say. I would just guess that, you know, say two weeks, not not that long, two weeks or a month, which is really a blink of an eye. Um, one story I heard, this is ties in with his comment about the, the Navy SEALs, is I was told when, uh, you you touched upon it earlier, is that when you'd be running lines, if, if you were a Baylor player, and I just had these players tell stories to juniors, which I just think is, <laughs> which, which is a fantastic lesson. Uh, like I, I think, you, you know, like you said, I mean, having lunch with someone, I think is many times more powerful than going out and feeding them forehands. But uh, yep. if you played for Baylor and you're running lines and you vomit, vomited, you didn't stop. You just kept on going. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, that's true. Right. And, and I think that's, Again, we, we tried to recruit with that, you know. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, look, it's for, for, for people that aren't high performance athletes trying to play at the professional level, you know, the idea that you would train hard enough that you would vomit is, is unimaginable, right? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, why in the world would you ever push yourself to that point? And there's probably people out there that would say that, you know, it doesn't make sense, even at the high level. But maybe I was old school enough that, yeah, you know, we felt like if we were trying to get a certain amount of work done and, and, and that was the response your body had that we could, you know, hopefully, you know, pause a little bit, you know, and, and, and work through it, you know, and, and I think what you find is that if you do, then you get, you get better, you improve and you gain a ton of confidence, you know, and I think nothing builds confidence more than facing adversity. And, you know, that's, that's, that's adversity. And, and then the thing that I think really helps a lot is you're doing it with, you know, seven other guys, you know, that are out there doing the exact same workout, right? So it's not, it's a lot different than if you go out, if I go out tomorrow by myself, right? See, you know, and it's me out there on a tennis court running. That's a lot different than me going out there with seven of my best friends and having a goal and, and going for it, right? As a group and having their support and having coaches that are supporting us and trainers and all those people. And, and I think, again, that, that's part of what built the, you know, the, the strength of character it helped us to be pretty good and, and also brought the team together, you know, and, and made them feel like they're part of something special. The book, uh, amazing racers about the cross country coach, Bill Harris, who's built it at the high school level, just a phenomenal uh, culture of sport is, you know, feel your teammates pain. 
you know, so you know, don't worry about your pain. Just feel your teammate. They're hurting too. Um, here's another uh, question from Anderson, a uh, fellow competitor, I'm going to guess with the timetable. Um, Anderson was with me eight years and Craig Tiley was with me seven years. Um, what do you, what comes to your mind? You think about you were, you were competing against the teams at Illinois, correct? Oh yeah. We played many, many times. What'd you think of Tiley's work and what he was doing? Well, I, I, Craig is one of the great coaches of the generation, um, you know, without question. You know, he took over a program that was, uh, you know, underachieving uh, massively, and, and he took it from nowhere to, you know, the very pinnacle of the, of the, of the profession. Uh, there's nothing more than you can say than, than that, right? He was able to refine a, a message and a vision that, was, that he was able to communicate with the top players in our country um, and beyond. And he was able to create a system or implement a system that, you know, obviously he worked with you guys on with great base. Um, and he believed in that system and he taught it and the guys believed in it and they got it a lot better. <laughs> you know, they, uh, all the guys improved tremendously. Um, yeah. I mean, there's just nothing you can say, you know, nothing. It's just an incredible job. And, and look, we've seen the, the flowering, if you will, of Craig Tiley. I mean, that guy had even a lot more to give now that he's in this role. What an amazing job he's done, you know, as, as, as the lead down in Australia. Uh, he's making an impact, a global impact on tennis. You know, he's done with prize money and how he's improved that tournament, um, which is not easy to do. I mean, I think that, you know, as a guy that's, that's not an Aussie, that wasn't a great player, to come in and, and have a strategy and make the improvements that he's made. Uh, he faced tremendous criticism from the people that were given a platform to criticize, and he stayed the course. And what he's done is, frankly, incredible. I mean, really amazing. No, initially, uh, Craig Tiley, for listeners, is South African, and he went to Australia first to be the director of player development, and now he's a tournament director and CEO. I remember people like Leighton Hewitt go, why didn't they hire a mate? You know, why didn't they hire a fellow Australian? <laughs> right. That's 100% um, true. And, and and he's been able to make a real, he's been so impactful for players. So the prize money piece, obviously, but making that tournament special, more special, uh, that's all him. I mean, he's been the leader of all that stuff. Yeah, Tennis Australia, I understand, you know, they're partnered with uh, the Labor Cup, and certainly he's involved in all the negotiations with what's coming down the pike. Um here in 2026 with more money coming into the game. Uh, yeah. You've already, yeah. you've already talked about Benjamin Becker um, with uh, David does, has make a few comments on uh, Dorsch, Benedict Dorsch. He's a yeah, you Baylor know, NCAA champion. Yeah. Ben is the most famous player because of what he did on the tour. Dorsch was by far the best Baylor player um, while in college. Um, you know, Dorsch was number one in the country for three years. Uh, and, yeah, he was all American in singles and doubles. He's all American doubles for three different partners. Uh, you know, just a phenomenal guy, just a uh, coach's dream. You know, just just an engine. You know, just a workhorse. Um, you know, when I came into the guys at the beginning of the year, I said, okay, everybody's got a schedule. So here's the practice and the weights and all the running and whatever, and everybody's got a schedule a minimum of one individual with me, and then if you want to do other individuals, you know, with me and the assistant, you know, let me know. And Benedict <laughs> went. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, Monday at nine o'clock with with coach. Tuesday at uh, eleven thirty with the assistant. Wednesday at I mean, boom, boom. He had everything mapped out. I mean, he was, you know, he was organized and he came. He practiced twice a day the whole time he was with us, and he brought it every single practice. Um, he went his first year with us and played the All American, which they have a thing. They have a pre quality and if you win whatever four or five matches, and you get into the quality and if you win two or three matches, you know, the main draw. Well, he, they didn't rank him, and they put him in the pre-quality. So he, he won and won and won and won, and he finally last lost to uh, Amir Delich in the semis. And I think it was like his, I don't know, 15th match or something over over a course of, you know, five days. It was just ridiculous. And I told him, I said, hey, I want you to take, you know, a few days off, you know, when we get back to town. And he said, no, I don't, I don't take days off. <laughs> You know, we're going to take some days off or you're going to get hurt. And I said, no, you know, this is how it's going to be. Well, then I had somebody come to me and say, hey, coach, I saw 
I saw Benedict practicing on the on the intramural course over on campus today. <laughs> so he he snuck over to the courts that were you know elsewhere, and and got one of the one of the one of the people off the team to go over and practice with him out of my line of sight, right? So he could still practice. So I found out as, as I said, and so I brought him in and I took his racket, and I said, if I hear that you hit again, you're not playing the next tournament. And oh, coach, come on, I got to practice. <laughs> And I said, well, look, that's why you get hurt all the time, right? You never, you don't have any balance in your training. And, uh, and that was his MO. He's, he's been hurt several times because he would overtrain. So anyway, that was the fight with Benedict is to get him to not practice every day. Uh, and I, I never had anybody else like that. I mean, that was, uh, you know, he's a one in a million guy. Benedict got to 127 ACT. He played main draw of Wimbledon. And, Honestly, if, uh, and I begged him to play doubles. I said, why don't you just focus on the doubles? Because there were some things with his game that were not going to let him, you know, be a, a top singles player. And I honestly think he, I mean, I, I, I'm sure of anything, he would have been a Grand Slam champion in doubles. Um, but he wouldn't play. He said, um, if I can't play singles, I'd rather just retire. So he did. So he never no, that was that, that was, shot. that was my next question. I, I saw him play a couple times. Can't say I really, you know, sat there and made an in-depth study of his game, but he was... You know, he was the name in college tennis for, as you said, for several years. Um, what were the couple of things in his game that uh, you think held him back in singles? Well, his backhand was really light. Um, you know, he could he could come over the one hand, he's a one-e, and he could slice it. Uh, but it landed in the middle of the court too much. Um, he he kind of twisted himself around, if that makes any sense to you, with the backswing. Um, the was a little off balance. So he could defend great and he could slice it. And then, of course, he would just get around and get forehands all the time, right? Um, but when you played against guys that played faster, you know, he couldn't get around. And his serve was very average. Um, and so he wasn't able to create enough, you know, uh, serve plus one against the top guys. You know, again, against in the challengers where he won several challengers and below, he could do that. But when he started playing guys that were, you know, top 75 in the world tech guys, he just didn't have enough uh, offense uh, you know, to be able to sustain the level. Um, but again, in doubles, you know, the, that stuff wasn't as important, you know, and, and some of his other stuff would, would work out pretty well. Uh, Dave uh, Secker, with, uh, he thinks the world of you and your son, you mentioned he's working at the, the tennis camp this summer in Raleigh, where you're currently based. Um, he asked, and some of his questions obviously overlap with uh, Joey's and Dave Anderson's, but if you could talk about fundraising, weren't you at Baylor when the, the facility went from uh, A to Z? It went from, you know, nothing, yeah, you know, nothing look, to we, everything? We raised, yeah, we raised $24 million. I raised $24 million at Baylor. And we, we had nothing. You know, we needed a facility. We needed, we needed a lot. You know, we didn't have an operating budget that was suitable for a good team. Um, uh, we didn't, you know, we couldn't pay the assistant coach. You know, on and on and on. Um, so we, we needed resources and, uh, what, what I learned, what I tell people now when I do consulting with college coaches, which is one of the things I do now is you, you you've got to find somebody in the community that can, that can help connect you to the other people in the community. Right. And, and so we had uh, an advocate, a physician in town, a guy named Scott, Dr. Scott Lindsay, that, you know, was a physician. And so he had some resources and he certainly helped us. But the thing he did have is he had access to all the other people in the Baylor community that had more resources than him. And our pitch was, if you know, you can either be the 50th guy giving money to football, or you can be the first guy giving money to tennis, right? Or, and we feel like if we build a great facility, we can host the NCAs and we can put Baylor University on the map and Waco on the map by bringing people from all over the country and all over the world to our community, you know, to play tennis. And so my very first year, we took uh, Scott and I and Monty Holtz, who's the chairman of a local bank, never played tennis in his life, uh, went to Texas Tech, uh, but owned a bank in town. He came with us to Athens, to the NCAs. And we taught Monty what it was, <laughs> you know, right? And the impact that it could have. And you, know, you saw the 5,000 people in the stands, and you saw the way the facility was six courts laid out in, in a row instead of three and three. and and, and all the things that you know that they did they've done so well traditionally in Athens and gave Monty the vision. And then Monty, because he had the 
the bank in town. He knew all the people with money in town, right? They're all had their money in his bank. And so all of a sudden, you know, Monty could call Jim Hawkins, who had a company and was very successful, and say, hey, you should take a meeting with this crazy tennis coach, you know, and let him tell you about the vision that he has to bring in this facility and bring in this tournament and bring in all these events to our community and how that would impact all of us. You know, it helps everybody. And again, uh, Jim Hawkins went to Arkansas. You know, and he wasn't a tennis player. Well, he was a tennis player, but he didn't grow up as a tennis player. He was as an older man. Jim and his wife, Nell, built the indoor center at Baylor. It's the Jim and Nell Hawkins indoor facility. Um, so Monty Holt, you know, we have a tremendous amount of money. His name's on the side of the building. Um, anyway, on and on. And so Scott helped connect me with all the people that could help us. Um, and then I spent a tremendous amount of time nurturing those relationships. I went out and played tennis with Jim Hawkins on uh, early mornings at uh, on the clay at Ridgewood Country Club and chased him down for, I mean, I don't know, 10 years before he finally made a donation to the program. Um, those kinds of things, right, where I really invested and I really felt like we could do something special. And, and guess what? We did, you know, and, and thankfully uh, – we got Jack Camrath, who, who, who designed the CCU facility uh, to be our architect. And you know, he was a huge advocate for doing the things we wanted to do and really helped uh, sell our administration and our president and our regents on our vision and how we, you know, we, we wanted to really try to do it the right way. And, and I think we did. We did a lot of things with you know, recessing the courts and making sure they were six in a row and having them spread far enough apart that we could host uh, challenger events and having the best lights that you could buy and, you know, all the different things that we did. Seats, uh, a lot of seats and shade structure and all the things that I think make Baylor the best facility in the country. And this and uh, now, this year, you're going to have the uh, fall tournament. The individuals are there, correct? They are. And then next spring, spring of 25, they're going to host the team again. So, oh, wow. And then, and then in, uh, this year, Spring of 2025, they're going to they're going to host the national team indoor. So we're splitting that with SMU. So it's a, a dual thing this year. They're trying with new, but so yeah, just in the next 12 months, they're going to host the new individual NCAA championship. They're going to host the team indoor, indoor and they're going to host the, the team outdoor championship. So you know, just imagine all the people that brings to Waco. You know, Waco is a town of 100,000. Um, it doesn't get a ton of tourists, uh, and so that's really significant for that community and something that I really feel proud of. And, and again, it all started with, you know, Scott Livesay and, and then those other key people that came along. Uh, could you talk a little bit about a, a former player, uh, the late Mark Hurd? Um, I mean, he's done so much for Baylor and beyond in tennis, correct? In his day. Yeah. Mark became a great friend as did his wife, Paula. Um, you know, Mark, Mark came along to us after we really had the, the bones of the facility were already in place. Um, <laughs> Kind of funny how I met him. Dr. Livesey, the man I just mentioned that was you know, a great advocate, called me and said, hey, you ever heard of Mark Hurd? I said, no. Nope. He said, well, he's speaking at the business school today, and he's a former Baylor player. I think he's pretty successful. And again, this is how Dr. Livesey was. He saw a guy that might have resources that might be able to help us, and he put me on the guy's set, right? I said, hey, you ought to meet this guy. I said, well, great. You know, and so about an hour later, I'm out at the courts, and I see this guy walking around and kind of just sniffing around the courts. And I went up and said, hey, um, Coach Knoll, you know, can I help you? And he was Mark Hurd. And at the time, he was the CEO of a company called NCR in uh, Dayton, Ohio. And I, you know, he played at Baylor. Great. And I, I assumed that he you know, wasn't a particularly strong player. Baylor didn't have a great tradition. And as we started to talk, he played number one on the team. And, and he was actually, a, he was a very good tennis player. He, he was, he was still playing very actively at the time. And, yeah, we became best friends. We were very good friends. We were very close. I mean, I spent many, many nights at their home, and um, they spent a lot of time at my home, and we we became very, very close. Um, and so he, of course, started to support us, and he helped us to enhance the, the, the locker rooms and the, the offices and put the shade structure up and put up the big uh, massive scoreboard and, and did some other things uh, to help us host tournaments. And then he was key in that incredible event we were running at Indian Wells. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but you know, Oracle um, you know, took over uh, Indian Wells. Yeah, Larry Ellison. Um, Larry Ellison. And, and when Mark later became the CEO of Oracle, um, he got Larry and he and I presented this idea to Larry. 
hey, you know, the second week, there's really not a lot going on in the outside court, right? So why don't we sponsor a college event? You know, and bring these college guys in and, and have matches on these outside courts. So it ended up developing to where we had a, we first had a 16 team tournament and we did it on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the finals. You know, that's a two week event. Um, and just as we thought, you know, people would roll in to, to see the, you know, the, the, the matches on the main stadium. And they wouldn't have anything else to do. There weren't other matches, so they'd come and watch the college matches. And Oracle supported it financially. You know, they paid people's expenses and and you know bought the hotels and all that. And then Larry had this incredible event at Porcupine Creek. And Larry has a essentially he bought a country club uh, in, in town, and he had uh, casitas there, and he would have guests. Uh, there's an 18 hole golf course, and Nadal and his team always stayed there. Uh, on Larry's property. So they would have this amazing banquet uh, at a level that, you know, none of us had ever seen before. And Rafa would come and speak um, and interact with the guys. And uh, I could go on and on about what that was all about. But yeah, uh, it was an amazing event. Um, so we changed it. We ended up doing uh, eight men and eight women's teams. So, you know, that we thought that was important. And it was just, it was, again, it was just unreal. I mean, we had the best teams in the country. You know, we had, you know, uh, Oklahoma, USC, I mean, again, all the top, top teams that everybody wanted to go. The, the thing was, you know, the SEC teams couldn't go because their schedule was already going and they, they had conference matches, so they couldn't make it happen. But, uh, but yeah, we had, you know, we had amazing teams there and, and some incredible experiences. Anyway, Mark, Mark did all that. And, and then, you know, we all know what Mark did with UCR and, and supporting that. And now he's supporting players and Paul has continued to do that. Uh, and support a player every year to help them get on tour. And, you know, the list of who they supported, you know, Mackie McDonald, uh, Daniel Collins, right. um, Chris Eubank. You know, it's been a it's just sort of a who's who of young Americans that have gone out and done really well. Um, so yeah, a, a terrible loss. You know, his daughter's eldest daughter, Kelly, went to Baylor. So we were, you know, my, my our family were big in, you know, helping her make that transition, supporting her. Um, and he's, yeah, he's, he's missed. Not only for the game tennis, but personally, you know, a, a guy that we were very close. No, I always heard great things about Mark Hurd. With uh, Dave Secker uh, moving on, uh, what you're currently doing, why don't you touch base with that? He's got down, you know, you know how you help junior tennis players with college placement and especially uh, how do you help mid-level juniors? Because I do think they're really the very top players. Uh, I heard that line from Tracy Austin one time is, Pro tennis will find you, and, and really, in a lot of ways, college tennis will find you, especially at the high levels. But here in the States, we have almost 5,000 colleges. Why don't you talk about what you're currently doing now? How how'd you transition from being a, a very accomplished college coach to your business? Talk to us a little about what you're, you're – give us the name of your business and just the breakdown. Yeah, thanks. What, what got me thinking about it is when I was at Baylor, I was getting two dozen emails a day from these online recruiting services. And, you know, we'll use UTR as a marker. My, my six guys are 13 UTR and they're sending me people that are sevens and saying, Hey, we want a full ride to Baylor. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> you know, and, and at the, at the beginning, Steve, I'd, re I'd respond to them all and say, Hey, you know, Jim, thanks for your email. I'm, you know, we're looking, you know, I don't, uh, good luck in your search. You're, you know, we don't have a spot for you at this time or whatever. But eventually you're just deleting them like spam. And I realized these companies are just shotgunning emails out, right? They're not really helping. And I thought it would be, I think it would make an impact and really make a difference and help. By using the fact that I know the system, I know all the coaches, and and advocate for these kids and help these families and make the process fun, and so that's what we did. You know, we we started this this company and and we built some incredible uh, partnerships with some top academies. Uh, and what we've learned is that you know these guys teaching tennis, you know they're on court you know eight ten hours a day. It's not easy to go home and 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 make calls to support the kids in the program. You, know, you have a family and. You know, you've got other things you need to be doing. You know, it's hard to really support. And, and the, the, all of them played college tennis, and they know something about it. But maybe it was some time ago. Um, you know, maybe they only know a few schools and a few coaches at the level they happen to play. They don't know the whole landscape, right? And we've been able to expose our clients to the whole landscape. You know, whether that's, you know, we have a client that's playing on a team at Ohio State. You know, we have a client that went to a junior college. We have a lot of clients. The majority of our clients are Division three players, right? They're they're kids that are very academic, um, that love the game, have played you know sectionally or nationally, and wanted to continue to play. 
and they want to try to play at the best possible academic school, a very selective school. And we know how to do that. We know how to help them position themselves to leverage the tennis, you know, to get admitted into a really, really top academic school. And, and so we've done that. And it's all about fit. You know, everybody's got a tennis level. Everybody's got an academic level. You know, everybody's got a financial situation. Um, and we try to make sure that we give them a list of schools that are appropriate to their level. And then again, I advocate for those kids, uh, you know, with the college coaches, you know, by calling them directly and saying, Hey, here's why this kid that's a nine UTR is somehow different than every other kid that's a nine UTR in the world. And, you know, there's a lot of them, right? And, uh, why would you want this kid on your team versus somebody else and try to characterize them in a positive way and, you know, and, and give them the best opportunity. And then, you know, I help them with the visits and, you know, all the things that come. And then I'm always available to talk to them as we go through, but, you know, it's, it's really been, really neat to see these kids be able to find their dream school and you know it's funny i just sent an email today steve for the class of 2025 and these these are kids that aren't even seniors yet you know this is the summer before their senior year we've already got kids that are committed to dartmouth northwestern williams chicago middlebury navy villanova case western you know some of the best schools in the country um and it's awesome you know it's just an absolute blast so Really enjoyed that and, and continue to build that. Uh, the other thing I'm doing is consulting with the college coaches, uh, which is also incredibly gratifying. And then the other thing maybe that I'm doing uh, you know, at, at the top of the list is being a search firm for ADs uh, hiring college coaches uh, because most of them are pretty conversant in you know football and basketball, but they, they don't really know much about the landscape for college tennis. And so I'm helping them you know, find a great coach for their program with uh when does someone get started with your company as early as say eighth grade or before high school or yeah great question the, the ncaa views you as a prospect when you start class your your uh, freshman year so that's that's a great time to start uh we don't directly reach out to the college coaches until spring of their sophomore year um because obviously you're going to get better you know uh, you know your freshman sophomore year but, uh, you know, we have some kids come to us. You know, I just signed a boy you know, earlier today that's a senior next year. We have some kids come to us even halfway through their senior year because, you know, they think it's going to work out. You know, I, I'm just going to kind of, you know, the phone's going to start to ring, right? But it, it's, I think people underestimate two things. One, they underestimate how competitive it is because, again, coaches are recruiting all over the planet. And two, they underestimate how there's an opportunity for every kid to play college tennis if you want to. I've played kids that are four UCRs. And if you're a, if you're a five UCR and you're a good student, I can show you a half dozen schools that would love to have you on the team. And, and they're with great coaches, great people. You know, coaches are going to add to your college experience by investing in you and, and really raising you up as a human being, not just as a tennis player. And, and so that's one of the things that's been a challenge for me when I go to the high performance academies. You know, they feel like these kids that aren't, you know, playing nationals you know, just aren't college players. Well, of course they are, you know, now look, you can't go to Texas and Baylor and I know how state, but if you want to be on a team and have an incredible experience and get a great education, you know, you can do it. And the, the feeling is the same. And this is something I've really learned a lot from watching my son at the division three level. You know, when your last match on, you know, and everybody's cheering, it feels exactly the same if you're in the division three or whether you're at the, you know, in a power four school. It, we're all humans. It feels the emotion is the same. And, and when you win and your teammates all come and jump on top of you and carry you off the court, it feels the same. You know, you don't have to be on TV to have that incredible feeling, you know, that I don't know where else you get it in life. You, get, you can't get that when you're, you know, when you're, uh, when you're 55, I can tell you that. Um, and I want every kid to have that. You know, they've invested in their tennis and, and we, we provide that for them, that opportunity to have that feeling and get a great degree and be around a great head coach. Well, that's a great point. I know the rules are, uh, how's it go? Um, I tell someone just trust but verify. A Ronald Reagan term: trust but verify. I, I believe this is a rule, but the rules are forever changing. Uh, years ago, I ran a program. We called it College Prep. We were based in Tampa for 15 years. I had a place where I could sleep 20 players, and um, we had basically just high school graduates. We all granted over spring break and summer summertime. Plus, we had local students. Um, but then the rule changed where 
Um, once you entered high school, you have four years to graduate. So now so many players we work with, they reclassify, they take the so-called gap year, eighth grade. Um, actually, Dave Secker told me at one time that the rule was possibly going to be changed, but it was just tabled and, and they didn't readdress the rule. But what one, what are your thoughts on that rule? And do um, you think that will change back where you can I, actually take a gap know, year? I've never been a fan of all those restrictive rules. Again, I think if it's whatever a family decides, I think when you come to college, you should be eligible for four years. I, I don't, I've never, I've just never bought into that, right? I think, you know, somebody will say, well, you know, Kobe Bryant could have gone to the NFL for, or excuse me, the NBA for three years and come to college and been eligible. It's like, okay, you know, but, but he's not going to, right? I mean, right? I mean, we're going to, we're going to potentially damage the experience of, you know, 5,000 kids because of something that may happen. Um, I really like the D3 rule. You know, D3, when you show up and start school, you're, you've got four years of eligibility. I, I think that just makes a lot of sense. And, and I think it's a shame that parents are having to go through all these genuflecting to try to figure out, you know, how to help their child have the best possible opportunity. You know, let's just let them, let's let them some come when they come. And, it, but, but to your point, that's not the rules. That's not the landscape that we're in. So, um, you know, that six month rule was the first thing. It was a year and then it's six months. And now it's actually nine months. Now you can play till March. So it was a moving target and it's very confusing. I guess for me, the good news is, you know, uh, people need me to tell them what the rules are because they do change so fast. Um, but it's a shame. I, I wish that was something where we just unify all the sports and, and make it simple for everybody. Uh, don't you think a lot of American boys, especially, uh, they want to go to a, a brand school and, you know, I think they're always chirping D1, D1, D1. And I think a lot of boys, um, I should say, I know a lot of boys, they go to a school that's over their head. Um, what are your comments on that? Well, I'm all about fit, Steve. I talk to kids about that all the time. And, and I think the toughest person for me to place in my business is the boy that's uh you know, a 10-2 UCR, right? Because they're they're very good. They've invested a lot in their tennis, and they have high ambition. They want to play Division One tennis, but they just there aren't opportunities for them at that level. You know, they're just they're just not quite strong enough, right? And so, you know, then they talk about you know what do you do then? Well, you you maybe take a gap year, or maybe you plan to go to a lesser school and and get better and then transfer. And you know, okay, that's a that's a path. Uh, you can redshirt. Um, you know, there's a, a few things you can do to try to get better and, and lengthen your runway, you know, the amount of time that you have. Um, I, I always wish that they would just go someplace that's an appropriate level and invest in, in that place and try to have an incredible experience. And, and you know, more often than not, they do, right? Um, but it is hard. You know, it is hard. I, you know, I've had kids say to me, I want to go someplace people have heard of. And then I said, well, who's heard of, you know, the people right. in the mall in Waco, <laughs> you know, people in the mall in Waco have heard of Florida and Baylor and Texas. But when you're trying to get into, uh, you know, the, the, the business school at Harvard, you know, they've heard of Middlebury and Williams and, and University of Chicago and Babson, you know, and Grinnell. So who's heard of, right? I mean, so I think it's about what your goals are and trying to line those things up uh, appropriately. No, I think, I, I think the other thing, go ahead. No, the other thing is division. It's never been a time in our history where division one is more clearly two divisions, right? Power four is a, is a division, and then mid major is a division, right? And the mid majors have very little in common with power four, right? They don't have near the resources or the revenue streams or the or the or, or the opportunities. And I think what a lot of people don't know is, you know, you look out there at some of these mid majors. They don't. They maybe have a team, but they don't have scholarships, for example. Right. When you look and see, well, gosh, why is this team not very strong? Well, that's because they don't have any financial aid or maybe they don't have a full time coach. You know, maybe the coach is making twelve thousand dollars a year and really working at a club. And this is just a side gig for him. You know, that, that's out there in, in Division One. Right. And I think a lot of people don't appreciate that. That's not nearly as good, in my view, as going to a Division Three school where you've got a dedicated coach that, you know, focusing all their energy on their team, on their young people and, and developing, you know, good humans. Uh, but I think those are things that people, it's hard to know that, you know, if you don't know. I think it's great for kids just to stay connected with the sport for so, so many reasons. One time I went to the, the, uh, club 
national championships. And it, yeah. it, it was a pretty respectable level. Um, no, absolutely. Uh, tell us uh, the power four. What are you referring to with the power four? Well, it's the, it's the Big Ten, the SEC, the Big 12, the ACC. Those are the four power four conferences. It used to be five, but now the Pac-12 is disbanded. So okay. the, they've got they've got all the resources, right? And 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 so you know they play football on TV and basketball on TV, and and they sell out the stadium, and they've got big endowments in many cases, and so they've got you know amazing facilities and great coaches and, and unlimited budgets, and, and they can do some fantastic things. But if you're at uh, you know if you're at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas, you know you don't have those things. You know you don't have a big endowment. You don't have a football stadium full of people. You don't play on TV. So your resources are really different. You know, you're not able to do the things that, you know, University of Texas can do with Texas A&M. Well, then also um, so the, the, the backstory, you take someone like Sherwood Stewart, who became one of the best players in the world, played Davis Cup. Uh, I put our fact checker on it, but I'm 99% sure he played at Lamar. Um, and, and they've had some great players. They had a coach, you know, way before my time. Uh, Hilly was his name. It was great. But now, right, if a great player shows up at a school like that, you know what they do the next year? They transfer, right? There's The rules have changed. It's so easy for kids to transfer. It's almost impossible for a, a mid-major to, to hold on to a kid with, with real potential because, of course, everybody else is going to see him and they're going to recruit him off that team. So, you know, it's just a very different time. Um, it's tough for those schools. Again, they just don't have resources. Well, a couple of things. I think one positive, and there's certainly many, of the UTR is just, it's consistent. You know, you're pretty much, uh, they tell you, you know, the UTR says you're a 10.2, a you're a 10.2. And I know some boys, especially, they'll, they'll, they're sent to me and they want to play at such and such school. They have their wish list. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure that it'd be tough for you to make the women's lineup. Um, yeah. Because they, they just don't have perspective. What about budgeting with uh, tournaments? Um, my my thought is that uh, families spend way too much money spending, and I know um, you're an advocate of playing multiple sports, but now the alpha generation, and many times it's one kid, one sport. Um, I did this just the other day. I said, okay, we have a group of 16 players here up in the mountains of uh, Virginia, um, Wintergreen Resort. I said, raise your hand if there's just one kid in your family. And then I said, okay, raise your hand if there's two kids. And then I said, raise your hand if there's three kids. Um, we do have uh, an intern from family of four. We have a student assistant, family of five. But none of the 16 kids raised their hand. Um, but don't you, my, don't you think people spend too much money on junior tennis in the early years playing tournaments? No, my feeling on that, Steve, is you've got to be the best you know, on your block before you need to be the best in your neighborhood and then the best in your town and then the best, you know, et cetera. And I think if you can play good competition, you know, driving distance from your house, then I don't understand why you would fly somewhere to play good competition. And I think that happens all the time. I think there's a prestige with playing, you know, whatever X or Y tournament. And I don't, I don't agree with that. I think, you know, play good competition, you know, play, play men's open, you know, play UTRs, play, there's, there's always something you can play where you can, you know, particularly if, uh, if you're not in a really rural area, right, where you can not have to spend all that money and you can drive home after the tennis that day, right, and not have to stay in a hotel and spend all that money. Yeah, this has been stated in our podcast before. I mean, the US, USTA, so many great people, so many great causes. Um, Winston Churchill, democracy is not perfect. So the 17 sections, I, I think it was such a mistake when all of a sudden there's you know, level two nationals, level three nationals, and people didn't stay in their backyard. And, you know, I think it was so much better when young juniors would call up adults, you know, a, you know, a 10, 11 year old playing a 55 year old, I'm betting on the 55 year old, you know, we call them the mushroom, yeah. you know, they pull the big floppy hat, they got the band on their elbow, they've got the pot belly, mm -hmm. they've got nothing, they can't move, but they can beat that hot shot 12 year old. But those, yeah. I don't, those matches don't exist anymore. Well, I, I, you know, we're, we're in agreement. I, I think it's, it's, there's no reason to spend a ton of money and, and wear yourself out uh, and you can stay close to home. And with your service, um, you have um, 
what, what's it called? Uh, showcase um, exposure camps. Yeah, we have a showcase. Yeah, we have a showcase at SMU. Um, and you know, I'm not in the showcase business. Uh, I'm in the placement business. But really, what happened there is, you know, Grant Chen got the job at SMU, and SMU's got a fabulous facility. He and I were talking. There, there's not a showcase for the, the level of kids that I'm working with in Texas. And we thought it'd be a great thing to have to help the kids from you know, Oklahoma and Texas and also the coaches to have something, you know, along these lines to get some exposure. And it's been great. You know, the, the, the people at SMU have been great to us. Uh, we've had a lot of wonderful people come through and, and it's, it's great. Um, uh, it, it's not my cup of tea because the organization side <laughs> is tough. Uh, just, frankly, the, the coaches have a lot going on. You know, it's just a, you know, they, you know, they've just finished the season or whatever, and they want to spend some time with their family, or they want to recruit, and they've, you know, their showcases have really proliferated all over the country. So, you know, to get enough coaches on site at the same time is a challenge. And same with the players. You know, it's hard to find a weekend. You know, every weekend, you know, you've got, you know, you've got the closed L3, and then you've got clay courts coming, and, you know, it's just uh, hard to find a time that, that makes sense. Matt, with um, placement, and do you use uh, a video service? Do you send video to coaches? Um, we, really, we really don't. Uh, and, and, and the reason is I, my own experience as a coach, I didn't really like video. I didn't watch it. I, I felt like they were very staged. Um, and, and maybe, Steve, it goes back to my thing about uh, Moneyball. You know, I felt like if you were winning matches, uh, I was going to be interested in you. And, and for me as a coach, if I saw the level, then I would go watch you live. Right? I, I didn't. I didn't. I, didn't, I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't know that you were good. See a video and then go watch live. I just went and watched you. You know. So maybe that's a. Maybe that's something I need to do better with in terms of our clientele. But I feel like uh, most videos are very staged. Uh, everybody looks good for two minutes. Um, and some some coaches do ask for a video, and so we have a very clear, we have very clear guidelines about how we advise our clients to prepare them, and and we do help with that but we don't make that part of our service where we go out and take video. For the parents listening, um, a young kid from Sweden spent years with us, Christopher Swanson. He played at Stetson. I mean, I could tell story after story. So parents just want to know what, what I thought of the college video. So I look at it and I look a little closer. I go, are you hitting with Edberg? He was hitting with Stefan wow. Edberg with his college wow. video. But I, I mean, I, I had so many parents that they've, they've edited the college video where the kid does make one unforced error. I mean, it's just, right. um, I do one thing, one nice thing that's done for the coaches is they, if they edit the in-between point time. Um, yeah. But I think it is a campaign. I mean, it does show that you're interested, but yeah, that's, uh, it's much better to see someone in person and uh, go, go to the video because they can be staged for sure. You can make me look really, really good in a three minute video. Um, <laughs> Right, and then I have to lie on the ground because I don't want to pass out. <laughs> but for a couple of minutes, you know, my stroke's pretty good and got a nice serve, and you know, so you feed me the ball in the right place, I look pretty good. Well, that's one of the things we do. People come in for a short period of time, and we do a pre and a post video, and you know, I, we film them a second time, and of course, the ball is being fed to them at ten miles per hour, and and you know, what we say to them when they they leave is. The operation was a success, but the patient may die because, <laughs> because they have to do so much work to get better. So much yeah. work, um, with, um, no, and I saw, uh, coming back to college tennis, this is hard to believe that Benedict Dorsch, uh, according to Wikipedia, and I know they could be wrong, only played three ATP matches on the main circuit. So coming back to him, he didn't stay out there very long then. He didn't play on the tour very long. Well, he had a couple challenges, right? He was an elite student, you know, as good as he was as a tennis player. He was ferocious in the classroom. So he had other opportunities, right? And he was such a perfectionist that when, you know, he, he won a lot of challengers um, and got up to, you know, a pretty good level. But he just couldn't be satisfied that he couldn't get, you know, over the hump. And he wouldn't play doubles. And then he had, he knew he had other options, you know, and so... Now he lives in Munich in a beautiful home. He works for a big software company. He makes 10 times more money than I do. And he has an incredible quality of life. And it's worked out pretty well. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, you no, know, I, I, um, I digress in bringing that up, but I just, the only reason I mentioned it is that the ATP level, um, you know, the, the, the elite division one level, um, you know, I love the old Bobby Riggs, you know, just get in the game, just be able to play. You know, it's so, so great yeah. to just compete, be part of a team. And, um, but yeah, that's where, uh, you've mentioned so many schools. It's pretty sure that, uh, each school you've mentioned, uh, I've had a student play or a student coach at with, how about connecting with yourself? I mean, what are the fees involved to, uh, use your services? Well, we have a range of fees and it depends on a few factors, right? Um, but it's you know we're not we're not a discount service you know the 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 low the you know the it goes you know starts pretty high and goes up um, depending on the amount of you know of, of personal attention you want to get um, you know and, and frankly you know the people that are you know not in a position to you know to, to afford what we're doing we're we're just not we're just not right for everybody right we're a boutique personalized service. Um, we do allow people to do a payment plan, you know, so if you want to spread it out over, you know, uh, several months, then we absolutely do that. You know, I tell families, look, I'm, I'm a coach, you know, I want to help, you know, but I also feel like, you know, I've been doing this a long time and you're going to get the best and we're going to have an incredible outcome. So, you know, it's just not for everybody. With uh, all sports or just tennis? We do do all sports. Um, we, you know, we've got a football player uh, at Notre Dame and a, uh, track guy at Florida and some other great, you know, successes like that. Um, I really don't pursue those actively. Uh, those are mostly just word of mouth. You know, I, I work with a tennis kid and their, their neighbors is a football guy. And so he calls us and we help him. Um, so I, you know, tennis is our expertise. We absolutely have had some great outcomes in the other sports, but we're not actively seeking those. And what about international students? Well, again, a few. Um, uh, you know, frankly, the biggest reason that we don't have a lot more is the, is our price point. You know, if I'm in Spain or Germany or England, you know, there's someone in my country that runs this kind of a service that's charging, you know, half as much as American college placement charges. And if you're from that country, you just it's not easy to see the benefit of getting a better service, right? They, you know, the person in your country speaks your language and is a good salesperson, and they've got something of a track record. So why would I pay twice as much, you know, to work with Matt Canola when I can work with this person, you know, here in my home country. And so we don't, we don't market in those, we don't market outside the U S um, we've placed, you know, a small handful of international kids, um, uh, just get word of mouth and those kinds of things. Uh, but we don't, we don't seek those kids out. Just a few more questions with, um, the, the difficulty in, in entering school, you, you mentioned to me before we went on air. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the SAT, the, the TOEFL test. Now it's Duolingo. Could you comment a little bit on those points? Well, it's frankly got a lot easier for the international kids because, you know, so many schools are test optional now. And the other thing that's nice about, about it for the international kid is they, in the past, were not eligible for academic aid, basically, because, you know, let's say you have perfect grades in France. Uh, then you take the SAT in a foreign language, and it's really difficult to score a high score, right? And and so, you know, most of the schools were giving academic aid based on a combination of your grade point average and your test score. Well, now that the test score is not part of it, and you walk in with a 4.0, now you often qualify for a significant amount of academic aid. So that's wonderful, particularly for boys, because as we know, boys is an equivalency sport, and, and, and so they often have to come, you know, for much less than – in a full ride and it's an out of pocket expense for the family. So this has been really wonderful for men's tennis, um, you know, to be able to get that academic aid they weren't in the past. Uh, the English requirement also has become much easier. There are other things you mentioned Duolingo and there are a couple others where, uh, frankly, it's just not as difficult, you know, to get the required score. So all of a sudden, you know, some of those doors open, um, you know, and there are more and more schools that are, are really not requiring English proficiency uh, as strictly as they did in the past because they've realized that it really isn't a predictor of academic success, as funny as that sounds. You know, we had kids that may have come in with, you know, incredibly low uh, English proficiency scores, but because they're good students and they're motivated, they did fine. You know, I mean, you have to, you have to be smart about what classes you take your freshman year. You, know, you don't take classes, you know, English literature. You take mathematics and statistics and classes that are more 
uh, quantitative, and then you, you know, over a semester, you, your English improves and you end up doing fine. You know, and I hear something I like, I, I make it a story and I tell people who I heard it from and where I heard it from. And um, I heard Dave Secker say that people need to realize that Spaniards don't tra don't train at the Spanish academies. Um, why I mentioned that is these big commercial academies, they have staffs that are doing what you're doing. But if you look at the placement of, and I don't want to belittle anyone, but if you look at the placement of some of these large commercial academies in in this country as well, but overseas, um, they just they just simply don't know college tennis like you do. Um, well, and and I'd say that the the challenge that even the, the academies in, in our country face is that it takes time, right? And it and you know let's say I run Big Academy X and, and the names that we've heard of. But what a lot of them do is they hire a young person and they pay them an entry level salary and, and oftentimes they say, okay, you're going to teach 30 hours a week. And then you're also going to place these 50 kids. Well, you know, that's not realistic. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're all going to find a place, but they're, they're not going to find a good place. You're not going to find the right place. And, and I, I don't think that a lot of the top brand academies aren't investing the resources to allow the kids to have the best possible experience. And as you said before, Steve, you know, look, if you're top hundred ITF, you know, coaches are going to knock the door down and you're going to do just fine. But if you're, you know, if you're not that level uh, and you need a little bit more tender, loving care, then frankly, they don't do a great job. They just don't. They, they just don't put the resources into it. Well, then there are the the Eric Buterak and Bud Schultz stories, the, you know, the players that, uh, you know, didn't play the, you know, um, one played at Babson, one played at... Uh, uh, Stephen, how's it? What's uh, Augustus? Was, was Davis the, Adolphus. Because yeah, she transferred from Ball State. With, um, I have to go back. Um, we can just review a few things. Dan Gable, I think all our listeners, I think that's one great thing about YouTube is to read uh, or view. Um, it's got to be documentaries online. Dan Gable, I I remember him being a. I mean, a childhood hero like this guy is amazing. You actually spent time with him when you were in Iowa then, huh? I did not spend time with him, uh, but I, I read everything about him, and okay. I was around people that were close to him. I became really good friends with the wrestling coaches at, at Northern Iowa. Northern Iowa was uh, around 15 in the country every year, which was amazing you know, for a school like that. Um, and, and wrestling, as you probably know, in Iowa was a huge deal. They sell out a big arena for the high school state tournament. But Again, my mentor there, the AD, had wrestled at Princeton. And so he was a wrestling expert. And so he and I, you know, spent a ton of time talking about the sport and going to the meets. The guy that I did get to know personally when I did a thing I called the Championship Project uh, was John Smith at Oklahoma State. The Championship Project, the, the genesis of that was we'd been top five or so in the country for a while and we hadn't won a championship. And I got this idea I wanted to approach coaches in other sports they had won championships and asked for their help. You know, what insights could they give me? And I reached out to coaches in all sports. One of the most generous with his time was John Smith at Oklahoma State, who's won more national championships than we can probably count and was also an incredible athlete himself, multiple uh, NCAA champion, Olympic champion, et cetera. John was great, and he taught me a lot about how to train teams that were good enough to win. Uh, you know, back to what I said about the mistakes I made with the 2000 team. He taught me a lot about how to work with teams that were, were good enough to win. And um, he and Dan hated each other's guts. <laughs> um, and they were very different, you know, in their, in their approaches uh, while they were both super successful. And so the contrast between how they uh, ran their program uh, taught me a lot. I learned a lot from just uh, watching from afar and also talking to those guys. Now, when I hear wrestling, uh... I know wrestling's really got beat up as a non-revenue male sport. So many wrestling programs have been dropped, but just to be around it back in the day, just high school wrestlers. I mean, I played ice hockey, but the, the, watching the wrestlers work out made all the hockey players where I grew up feel like wimps. You know, there, I had a yeah. one of my, my oldest sister, she taught school for a few years and she was just dis disturbed by these kids wearing wetsuits and not eating for three days to try to make weight and, 
working out in a rubber room it's where the temperature is just off the charts wrestlers like wow um i'm glad they're out there steve because it makes the way i train my team look like it's you know pedestrian because we didn't do anything like those crazy guys yeah but there's so many things even like your wife you said that she's a an iron triathlete i mean it's all to me it's all about character someone's going to make a change in their forehand in the end i tell people if you're really at a high level it's it's okay with introducing tennis basics to beginners but if you can't teach character you're really not going to be able to teach technique it's character first well i believe that and i think that's what makes the job fun to be honest and that's the good part of it right uh, all the good i think is, is locked into that and all the other stuff comes from that I, matt i really didn't want to interrupt you but you mentioned bob faulkner bob faulkner from tyler texas yeah oh well, yeah yeah so he must have been a baylor graduate he was, and, and I'll tell you the thing about, about Bob is great. He donated the position, you know, to the money to fund the coach. And, and, I, and, you know, so I'm talking to him on the phone or whatever. We did this over the phone. And he said, and I said, Bob, I want to come up and, and thank you personally. And he said, oh, no, please don't do that. <laughs> I said, no, Bob, it's a pleasure. You know, this is a big deal. This has an incredible impact. And he said, no, please don't come. Well, me being an idiot, I went anyway. So I, I basically invited myself to go to his house. I brought in some t-shirts and some gear and, you know, wanted to just, again, it was transformational, the gift that he made for our program at that time. And, and he was such a humble man that he felt so uncomfortable being thanked like that, you know, and being honored for the wonderful generosity that he's given. And as you may know, the, the big tennis center in Tyler is named after him because of his wonderful generosity. Right. Dr. And, Park, yeah. Right. And he also, uh, became a mentor to one of the high school programs in Tyler of one of the, 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 the schools that had more of the less fortunate kids, you know, they didn't have resources to play. And yeah. he, no, I know he well, sponsored. John Tyler. I spent a lot of time yeah. with Bob Faulkner. There you go. So John, so anyway, he sponsored that team. And so then I would run into him at like, you know, the high school regional, you know, he'd be there with their team and uh, cheering for their guys and get them water and get them a subway sandwich. <laughs> You know, he was amazing. You know, very so humble and and generous. Uh, yeah, that's that's Bob. No, he he He's loved amazing. Bob Faulkner. Loved tennis. Of course, when I started in Tyler, I was 26 years old. I was given the opportunity to revise his curriculum, and I knew he was helping out because we were, uh, like, say, at John Tyler, the powerhouse was Robert Lee. You understand? They dropped the, the name. Uh, I coached so many kids who played at Robert Lee, and they won so many state championships. But we would have our students in this tennis teaching program go to the different parks and 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 go to uh, John Tyler High School, among other places, the YMCA. So he was a very soft-spoken gentleman, always around yep. tennis. But he used to always come and tell me, Steve, you're doing it the wrong way, Steve. And his point was <laughs> that girls, girls cannot serve in volley. They just can't serve in volley. And I said, I disagree. I mean, and... Uh, and, you know, of course, you make a very good point, like Steph Curry with a guy who's six foot eight in front of him. I mean, I had the opportunity to see Billie Jean King play at Wimbledon. And to me, I mean, people look at me like I'm crazy, but there's not one person on the tour. I mean, now that Ash Barty's retired, but there's not one player on the tour that could play from the service line in on the women's tour like Billie Jean King. <laughs> Maybe even yeah, the, men, the, men, the men for that matter. But yeah, uh, you know, Dave Anderson, uh, uh, Chad Clark's sister, Carmen Clark, Lauren, Laura Barrow, Lisa Kimmel, and Julie Scott. So these neighboring towns, Longview and Tyler, these two girls won, well, one team won. And it was uh, Julie Scott who went out to Stanford, and one year she was 29 and one. But we always tell people, you got to serve by both balls. Just start now, just, just go. And uh, But anyway, the gentleman he was, he, I remember him coming out and said, Steve, and I just talked to him for a few minutes. I said, yeah, sir, what's up? He goes, I just want to tell you, you've proved me wrong. Girls can serve in volley. So that's, that's my, my Bob Faulkner well, story. <laughs> yeah, great guy. And then also another, I talked to you forever, Brad Brookshire, a group of his trained, Brad Brookshire, the, the Brookshire family money, they had a lot to do with building that SMU facility. And, you know, Dave Anderson would have been there. Craig Tiley, the, they were both with me when we were training a group of guys. Brad Brookshire was one of them. 
and they wanted to train like juniors. And I remember Tyler, he was working on his master's in kinesiology. So we got into fitness and you know, body weight and body fat and such, body composition. So these guys go out to play, uh, I don't know, a four or five national. And like three of them were just told, you know, basically it's just like four games in and say, they're just pulled off because this match is defaulted. You're not a, maybe it was a four. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, it's, just, I, I mean, I really enjoyed living in Texas. I always say that people in Texas are, are like people from Boston. I mean, people in Boston, if they've never left Boston, they still think it's the greatest place in the world. And te yeah. Texans, um, they had te the missionary zeal. This is the greatest place ever. Um, That's true. The, um, but no, it's been great to have you on as a guest. We'll, um, but, but let's just do this one more time. Tell us the name of your company and how people can contact you. Yeah, my company is called American College Placement. Uh, my email is matt at americancollegeplacement.com. Uh, happy to talk to anybody that wants to play college tennis. Um, we take a lot of pride in the fact that we've helped everybody that we've connected with, you know, find a great place. And uh, we want to make it fun. We make it fun for the parents and fun for the prospects. Oh, it's great. Uh, one thing, I don't know if I said the senior moment, but uh, I did look up your son who's playing college tennis and is a class president, multi-sport athlete, and keynote speaker at his graduation. That's kind of cool. Let's go through the list. So Yvonne will go quickly. Uh, some, see, he's been taking some notes, and uh, we'll, we'll do that and wrap this thing up. But you certainly have given us so many golden nuggets for one's tennis treasure chest. Yeah, man. Ah. Thank, thank you. It was great listening to what you had to say. Let me go through some notes I took down here. Um, always feel like you're playing for something bigger than yourself. You talked about mm -hmm. the four quarter, uh, four quarters workout, where it's um, a physical selection type of process. Um, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And then um, why not us? You know, um, calling up the top 200 boys and not being afraid to make those calls. Never miss wide, never miss in the net. It's okay to be bad, just don't be stupid. I love that. <laughs> no issue with needing improvement. You can make a main draw of a major just by being a really solid player. You don't need to play like you need to beat Roger Federer. I'm going to uh, put, I'm not going to put guys in the locker room that aren't like you. College tennis teaches through tough environments. Teacher, uh, you're a teacher who found tennis as a way to teach. You go on runs through the woods and campuses on Saturdays with your, with your team. Bad players want to be left alone. Good players want to be told they're good and great players want to be told the truth. Never once not prepared. Um, you set the standard. Um, submitting to the brand. Um, you talked about how you're disappointed how tennis teams have become the wording I, I didn't write it down, but it was less competitive, but didn't don't feel like they can um, compete with the top teams or strive to at least. Respect first, love second. I, I, I think that I think that, I'm sorry to cut you off. I think to that point, I think that the most important thing you have to ha you, you need to have is hope, right? If, if you don't have hope, then then nothing else happens, right? And if you if you start the season or start building a program and you don't feel like we can be the best, right? I mean, then you're not going to be. And I think that's submitting to the brand. That's sort of giving up in a way to me. You know, I mean, I think you got to have the hope that you can achieve greatness. Uh, and if you do, then sometimes you stumble into greatness. Yeah. Sorry. I hope to achieve. No, thank you. That's, that's great. Um, Steve mentioned softer pillows, sweeter marshmallows. That was your that was your guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, it was from uh, Jim Lair. Jim Lair. Jim Lair, yeah. If you vomit, you keep on going. Nothing builds confidence more than facing adversity. Feel your teammates' pain. Steve mentioned that from Amazing Racers. Um, you mentioned one of your players. I don't take days off. <laughs> um. You want to be the fiftieth to support the football team, or the first to support the tennis team. Um, and the the quote or when when players say, "I want to go to a school that someone's heard of," you know, who's heard of? <laughs> who's heard of? 
Is it at the Waco Mall? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, everybody could look good for a few minutes. Um, college videos can look staged, and girls can serve in Bali. It's the same thing about matches, right? When you watch matches, a lot of people look good for you know 15 minutes, and then you wonder why they lost this one to go. I mean, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> That's the sport. Yeah. You know, I always mention Welby Van Horn, who you mentioned Manny Diaz. Manny was taught to play by Welby. I was yeah. taught to, I was taught to yeah, te well, teach, by, teach by Welby. Welby would just ask people, how do you develop a tennis mind? But uh, for you to just listen to some of these golden nuggets to make a total understatement that you you definitely have big time tennis mind. I just, so many pearls. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay to be bad, but it's not okay to be stupid. Um, the, uh, one of my friends, his father used to tell us, because we were all, you know, when you're 11, 12 years old, okay, he, he would just say, hey guys, this goes to the territory. You're, so, you're all stupid. I was stupid when I was 11 or 12. But I like the one where uh, it's okay to be it's okay to be stupid, but don't be lazy. But I sound I think the uh, the work ethic is legendary. I mean, uh, I know uh, people refer to you as a college coaches coaching legend, but uh, the work ethic and what you accomplished with your players is just that. Awesome. But Matt, thank you very much. Uh, this has been fantastic. I know uh, um, there's so many podcasts now, but we do have a following of people who are. Uh, very passionate about the sport. And I know, I know, uh, Yvonne, you said it, Yvonne mentioned it. I love how you said, it, you know, confidence comes from adversity. Um, we don't really think it's, a, it's adversity to listen to a two hour podcast, but, you know, it, <laughs> but if people just listen to 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, um, you know, again, golden nuggets, but, uh, again, Matt, thank you so much for being a guest. It was great. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I, I really love what you guys are doing. And please make sure when you come back to Raleigh to hang out with Sector and these guys that you uh, let me know so we can get together. Yeah, I'll do that. I scheduled to go back there. And with, uh, I, I was there twice uh, recently. Um, there's an outfit, tennis block in Raleigh. They're based in Raleigh and they're reaching, uh, which is great. They're getting the tennis courts at uh, apartment complexes and parks and, um, you know, small schools and geez, they have over a hundred people teaching for them. So, uh, Dave and his associates have been fair enough. So it's so nice to host the, the workshop at their place, but, um, yeah, we'll get together. It was super Matt. Canola. Right, thanks. Have a great night. All right. All Appreciate the best. It. Thanks again. Good night. Right. Well, Yvonne. Wow. 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 Just, I love listening to a guy like that. Yeah. He's you know, juniors need to hear that, but just, you know, it's almost like write that down. Did you hear that? Did you get that? Um, you know, I think of Braden, uh, Vic was so nice to say, so Steve, we should have worked together all these years and done this and done that. I said, yeah, Vic, you go forward with a flashlight and, uh, make new discoveries. And I go back with a club and hit people over the head. Did you get it? And, uh, obviously he, he gets tennis. Um, uh, it's just, I mean, sometimes it's, you know, simplification is sophistication. We just, you know, I asked about shot tolerance. I mean, there's so many things, but just that one thing is uh, well worth listening to this podcast. But Matt Canole, thank you, thank you, thank you. Listeners, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yvonne, I know you do the work with this podcast, the majority of it for sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll wave goodbye to the camera. Another podcast in the books. All right, thanks. Next time. Adios.